The next item of business today is a debate on motion 9821 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on developing the young workforce review of progress at the midpoint of the seven year programme. Any member who wishes to speak in today's debate, I would encourage them to press their buttons to let me know. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to speak to and move the motion. Presiding officer, this year, 2018 March Scotland's year of young people. That is an opportunity for us all to focus on the contribution that young people across the country make to our communities and to our society. On the 12th of December last year in this chamber, the Minister for Child Care and Early Years set out this government's ambition for 2018 to ensure that our young people feel and believe that they are valued, <laughs> wanted and vital to our country's future. One of the most significant ways in which we can work to that end is by supporting Scotland's young people to achieve the best possible outcomes for the lives ahead of them. In our programme for government, we made clear our prioritisation of education and our ongoing commitment to equip our young people with the skills and qualifications they need to succeed in a rapidly changing labour market. So it was in this context, and this year of young people, and in light of our commitments in our programme for government, that I welcome the opportunity to update the Chamber on the progress of our youth employment strategy, developing the young workforce, as laid out in our third annual report published earlier this week. The evidence and recommendations of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce's final report, Education Working for All, gave us a, a shared vision of how we can tackle youth unemployment and in so doing address inequality and improve social mobility. The report was widely welcomed by members across this chamber. This government responded quickly and unequivocally to accept the 39 recommendations made by the Commission and we made plain that we shared its vision of a world-class vocational education system. Uh, we are now at the halfway point of the programme's seven-year period, which is marked by a milestone achievement which I'm confident that we will collectively uh, welcome. Uh, President Officer, we set a stretching target and ambition that by 2021 we would have reduced youth unemployment here in Scotland by 40% from 2014 levels. We have met that target four years early. I'm also pleased to note that Scotland's youth unemployment rate has fallen from 25.5% in October 2011 to 9.7% in October last year. Not only do we have a, a lower youth unemployment rate than the UK as a whole, but we are now also consistently amongst the best performers in the entirety of the European Union. It, of course. Joanne Lamond. If you have any figures on the variable uh, employment rate within Scotland, because I think there are, there are probably quite grave variations there, and I'm interested in what you're going to do to tackle that. Jimmy Ever. Well, I, I would recognise, of course, there are uh, variations, some of them quite significant within uh, different uh, uh, communities. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm going to do to tackle it is to continue to promote the developing the young workforce agenda that has seen uh, so much uh, uh, progress. And I would uh, recognise that we need to maintain uh, this progress and continue uh, the downward trajectory in youth uh, unemployment and in particular there is more for us to do uh, for those who are not uh, in employment education or training many of whom face a variety of barriers to such destinations and uh, many of whom will be in the very communities that Joanne uh, Lament has uh, referred to that's why it remains critical that we continue our long-term uh, plans to strengthen education skills partnerships between schools colleges uh, training providers and uh, employers as I uh, visit schools colleges and employers engaged in developing the young workforce activity, I'm constantly met with energy and enthusiasm by those involved. The collective endeavour we see with the, those partners and with a local government who share a leadership role uh, with this uh, Scottish government embedding the strategy is making a difference. We now have 21 developing the young workforce regional groups covering every part of Scotland. I have been impressed with the range and diversity of initiatives that are being led by each group in their own region responding to their own circumstances, but all working to the same end of ensuring our young people, wherever they live in Scotland, have the skills, learning and training opportunities they need to equip them for the world of work and indeed for the lives ahead of them. We need employers at the heart of our approach to developing the own workforce, which is why each group is chaired by a representative industry in their region. Their role, input and commitment is critical. Thanks to this partnership effort, we are seeing positive changes. The volume and number of S5 and S6 students enrolled in college courses at SEQF level 5 and above increased almost 40% in one year from 
2,169 in 2014-15 to 3,014 enrolments in 2015-16. These higher level courses are the key to getting more young people re-engaged in education and moving into higher level skills Scotland society and economy needs. And we are offering a, a wider range of options for young people in school, including the expansion of the foundation apprenticeship, providing accredited work-based learning alongside other course choices in the senior phase. I can advise part that foundation apprenticeship opportunities are now offered across all local authority areas and we will continue to expand these opportunities. In 2017, we saw more than 1,200 foundation apprenticeship starts up from 346 in 2016. I can set out to Parliament today that this year coming, we will support over 2,500 foundation apprenticeship starts in Scotland schools. It's better to promote these new opportunities and help strengthen employer engagement in schools. Careers advice is also being offered earlier in school, and we've established and continue to develop the career education standard, a work placement standard, <coughs> and guidance in school employer partnerships. And we also see Scotland's colleges making a vital contribution to the developing the young workforce agenda. And the successful completion rate of higher education provision in colleges overall has increased from 73.1% to 73.9%. At the same time, 83.9% of college leavers aged 16 to 24 years are progressing to a positive destination of higher study, training, work, or into a modern apprenticeship. We also see colleges strengthening their links with employers, with 85% of colleges now having established employer industry advisory boards to review and enhance curriculum quality, planning and outcomes. The expansion in foundation apprenticeships that I referred to a few moments ago has been matched by an expansion in modern apprenticeships. In 2016-17, we exceeded our target of 26,000 modern apprenticeship starts, with 26,262 people beginning an apprenticeship an increase of 444 from 25,818 in 2015-16. An apprenticeship offers a, a fantastic opportunity to learn new skills while earning and gives employers the chance to grow their own talent while building a highly skilled workforce. Of course. Elaine Smith. Thank I thank the Minister. I thank the Minister for taking that intervention. I wonder if you if the Minister could outline for us what's being done about the gender issues within apprenticeships. Minister. Yeah, well, that is a point I'll uh, come to, but uh, we have recognised that has been a historic uh, issue. It is indeed it's still an ongoing issue, but it's one that we are determined to uh, take uh, head on. Uh, over uh, the period of the last decade, we have seen an increase in the number of women undertaking uh, modern apprenticeships. Uh, generally, there are still uh, some particular frameworks uh, that uh, we need to, uh, to do rather better in. Uh, and I'll refer to some of the work that we're doing uh, later, but of course uh, we have tasked uh, Skills Development Scotland through its Equality Action Plan uh, to take uh, efforts in that regard. And we are seeing improvements, but I recognise we need to see uh, further improvements still. Uh, President Officer, <coughs> we, uh, we remain focused in delivering our commitment to increase new apprenticeship starts to, to 30,000 per year by 2020. Uh, so today I can announce that we will fund up to 28,000 apprenticeship starts next year as the next step towards that target, up from our interim target of 27,000 uh, this year. I'm also pleased to say that the Pathfinder phase of exploring graduate level apprenticeships has proven its worth. We'll for the first time formally include and recognise the important contribution graduate level apprenticeships make to achieving our annual delivery targets. After successful testing of the graduate level apprenticeship model over the past two years, confidence and demand from both our higher and further education institutions and from employers is not a pace and level where these high level skills opportunities can be mainstreamed into annual apprenticeship delivery targets underlying the Scottish Government's commitment to graduate level apprenticeships. Of course. Uh, Ian Gray. The target is for uh, level three and above modern apprenticeships this year. Uh, Minister. I would need to come back to Mr Gray with that uh, specific uh, uh, figure uh, in writing. I don't have that right in front of me right now. I could uh, try and look through this substantial briefing I have in front of me, but rather uh, than uh, that unedifying spectacle, let me commit to uh, write to Mr Gray uh, with that information in uh, due uh, course. Uh, as a, a result of the, the investment we have uh, made uh, in graduate level apprenticeships, uh, President Officer, I can uh, tell this chamber we will uh, see the introduction of, of new graduate level opportunities in business and management, construction, and cyber security, all areas of critical importance for employers across Scotland. At the same time, we are introducing a number of enhancements to ensure 
uh, modern apprenticeships continue to, to meet the needs of young people, of employers, and to support the development of key and priority sectors in our economy. It'll of course. Liz Smith. I'm very grateful to him. Um, on that theme, will it also include uh, the suggestions from Inclusion Scotland that it will help those uh, who have disabilities to be part of the workforce? Yes, yes just as um, the point was made by Eileen Smith about the need to do rather better in terms of <laughs> uh, ensuring better gender representation within our modern apprenticeship frameworks, so too I recognise the need to do uh, better in the area of ensuring that people with uh, a recognised disability, uh, learning disability, the example being uh, posited by Liz Smith, but disabilities uh, more generally, we need to do far better in ensuring participation in uh, not just modern apprenticeships, but our entire labour market. And of course, we've set out uh, a, a reaching and demanding target to half the, uh, the disability employment gap in our uh, uh, disability uh, strategy. Uh, and of course, uh, doing rather better in uh, modern apprenticeship frameworks would make a substantial contribution. I am pleased to see uh, through the activity that we have undertaken, again through the quality action plan, that we are doing better, but there's still a, a long way to go, and I would, I would uh, recognise uh, that. Uh, we also, uh, President Officer, have to, to do more to support our rural uh, communities uh, better access modern apprenticeships as well. Uh, last year, uh, I announced the introduction of a, a supplementary payment for training providers in recognition of the additional costs involved in the provision of training for modern apprentices in rural communities. Uh, during uh, this year, 2017-18, that rural support policy was available for trainees who resided in Aberdeenshire, Argyll and Butte, Highland, Murray, Orkney, Perth and Kinross, Shetland, uh, Western Isles, Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish Borders local authority areas and the Isle of Arran in North Ayrshire. Uh, this year, I'm pleased to confirm that not only will we continue with the rural supplement, but this will now be made available to training providers based in all postcode areas defined as being geographically rural, extending this support across all of Scotland's rural communities. Uh, from April, we also support the extension of the early years workforce as part of our commitment to near double early learning and childcare for three and four year olds and eligible two year, old, two year olds by substantially increasing the level of contributions to training costs across all age groups of apprentices. And we'll also increase our contribution to training costs for dental nursing apprenticeships and management apprenticeships. These enhancements all help to make our apprenticeship programme an attractive offer. I am clear though that ensuring the equality of access to opportunities, something that we have already touched on, is key to the long-term success of developing the young workforce. That's why I ensured that the 2018-19 in modern apprenticeship contracting instructions for providers should re-emphasise explicit equalities requirements to help advance equality of opportunity. We are, as I've alluded to, making a progress. In December, we published an updated equality impact assessment which showed the breadth of this progress. In 2016-17, we've seen the success of the Stepping Up programme run by Enable Scotland, which supported 1,571 young people with disabilities in 70 schools across 11 local authorities to access careers guidance and work placements. Of all those engaged, 98% achieved a positive destination. Colleges working to tackle gender underrepresentation at subject level in all college regions have set out their commitments within new gender action plans. SDS published its first annual update on its modern apprenticeship equality action plan that I've referred to in July 2017. This reflects on both progress across a range of indicators and more importantly includes details of further efforts to reduce gender stereotyping, increase the number of MA starts from minority ethnic communities, optimise the ch chances of a successful transition for care experienced people into apprenticeships and to increase <laughs> the number of individuals starting apprenticeships who have a learning or physical disability. But we know there is more to do to address barriers to work and training for some young people to tackle and equality ensure all of our young people have equal chances and choices to succeed in life. Going forward, we must build and progress to date. And that's a challenge to all our partners, including our employer groups. Long-term change will only come from fully embedding the developing young workforce approach within the school curriculum. To help achieve this, we have placed that approach alongside GERFIC and Curriculum for Excellence as part of the three interrelated drivers of our ambition to create a world-class education system with the needs and interests of children and young people at its heart. The President Officer, young people at the heart of our ambitions, and we look forward to their continued engagement over the course of this year of young people, which we will use to help further promote developing the young workforce to pupils, to parents, and to practitioners. And so too will we 
continue to promote the benefits of this agenda to all of Scotland's employers, urging them to get involved in improving the life chances of Scotland's young people. I look forward to continuing to showcase the personalities, talents and achievements of Scotland's young people, something I know all of us in this chamber can be relied upon to do. I take great pride in supporting this agenda on behalf of the Scottish Government. I commend the motion in my name, which I now move to Parliament, and I hope we will unite in backing that decision. Thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on Lisbeth to be followed by Ian Gray. Lisbeth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I want, if I may, to begin my own comments this afternoon with reference to the contribution that young people made at the time of the 2014 referendum. A contribution which incidentally changed uh, my views about whether or not 16 to 17 year olds should have the vote. I had previously not been in favour, uh, based largely on what young people themselves had told me when I'd been in schools, but I was uh, very much uh, of the opinion after 2014 that they were a highly articulate group within the debate and good for them as a result of that. But I was particularly struck by the frequency, irrespective of what their views were be, would be about the future of Scotland, I was particularly struck by the frequency of their references to education, to skills and opportunities in the job market. They cared deeply about their education and their employment and what they expected from it. And so I think it's a very good starting point uh, for the Scottish Conservatives in today's debate. And I warmly welcome what the Scottish Government uh, has said in its motion and also the comments uh, from the Minister this afternoon. I'll come back uh, to some of these uh, in a minute. But I want to pick up uh, a constant theme from uh, young people and also from employers, irrespective of who they are, that they want to have a strength in literacy and numeracy, first and foremost, because it is only by acquiring that strength uh, that the other doors of opportunity actually unlock. And that's a constant theme from many employers. Some of them have been telling us that they're still having to spend a considerable amount of money topping up these skills when young people come into the workforce. If we look at the 2016 employer skills survey, 31% of Scottish employers said that there was a lack of complex numerical skills amongst applicants. 16% actually said that that applied to all their applicants, which I think is quite a worrying statistic. It was 18% on the ability to follow uh, basic writing instructions, 17% on IT skills. So I'm very pleased that, that the Scottish Government uh, is trying to address some of this, not just through Curriculum for Excellence, but also uh, through um, better opportunities within uh, the, the labour force. And I am also pleased uh, with the Scottish Government's decision to introduce uh, STEM bursaries. But let's be clear that these will not have the greatest impact if we cannot solve some of the other skills within schools. And on that theme, I've been very struck by what some employers have said to me and also some teachers uh, recently, that it is time to think again about whether we should have a discrete qualification in arithmetic. Now, I've spoken to Janet Brown about this in SQA, not because uh, I feel that there is anything necessarily wrong with the mathematics courses, but the point that's been made by a lot of employers is that the, the basic skills of arithmetic are fundamental when it comes to the ordinary working of many of our young people. And some of that um, is important in terms of uh, not having the distraction, if you like, of mathematics when people find that a bit difficult. And I was very taken with what Janet Brown was saying about the possibility of reconsidering this, uh, particularly as the Scottish Government and the SQA are looking to reform uh, National 4. But I think there's another issue about the curriculum for excellence, and that is ensuring that within the desire to offer the broad general education, that there is as much emphasis laid on the need to acquire knowledge as to learning new skills. Because I think the curriculum for excellence, for very good reasons, has focused a great deal on the skills element, but I don't think necessarily that there has been the same focus on that knowledge base. And it's very interesting, given that the National Library of Scotland has now made available the archive of a lot of exam papers over the years of the changing focus of that. And I think that's reflected in what many of the employers are telling us about our young people. Now, clearly, the Scottish Government has devoted a great deal of time and no doubt taxpayers' money on its plans to develop Scotland's young workforce. And there are good ideas here. Let's not be in any doubt. But I also think there's a need to reflect more on what Sir Ian Wood said in his seminal report about vocational training, because there's been very strong cross-party agreement about this. But I wonder if really enough is being done to implement his recommendations, because vocational training is not only the right thing to do for our young people for educational reasons, it's obviously the right thing to do uh, for the economy. And 
lots of really good things have happened in recent years, whether that's the modern apprenticeship scheme that the Minister has spoken about, the opportunities for all programme projects that have been set up by the Chambers of Commerce or skills academies like uh, Queen Margaret University in the hospi hospitality and tourism sector. These have all played uh, a major part, I think, in extending opportunities. But the vast majority of young people continue to be faced with uh, a school system that doesn't necessarily have the diversity. And I'm not talking here about different kinds of schools, about the diversity of choice within the vocational uh, route as much as the traditional academic one. Because I think that for too long, Scotland has not taken advantage of some of the uh, thoughts that Ian Wood uh, has put before us about where the, the, the the encouragement and the incentive amongst young people could grow so much more if these vocational opportunities were extended and expanded. And I think he points in his reports uh, to other countries, whether it's Germany or Denmark, about the, the influence of that greater uh, choice within the curriculum. And this is not just talking about different subjects, this is talking about the different emphasis within the, particularly in the uh, older years of senior school, where that emphasis is, because it's very important that we should stay. Yes, of course. Jamie Ever. I wonder if she would accept that we, we are still in a, a rather early period uh, of rolling out the, the new developing young workforce uh, agenda. It's about whole system change, and surely she would recognise and welcome that what I've just said a few moments ago, uh, two years ago we saw 326 foundation apprenticeships in Scotland schools. Last year we saw over 1,200. Uh, next year we have a, a target of over 2,500. The Deputy First Minister has already set out publicly previously from 2019 there will be 4,000 uh, such uh, opportunities in Scotland schools. So we can start to see that direction of travel she's talking about. Uh, yes, Minister, I do accept that, but I think there is more to be done in school level. And if, if I read uh, Sir Ian Wood's uh, reports uh, correctly, and also um, what some of his predecessors said too, the opportunity for vocational training to have that diversity needs to start below the actual job market. And I think that's the point that we need to, to try to get hold of, because if we read the evidence from uh, European countries, I think many of them are being successful because of that uh, diversity of choice. And I think also, if I could just uh, spend a little bit of time on some examples of those who've traditionally been uh, disengaged from the school um, system. If we look at the, the um, example of Newlands Junior College, which has been a highly successful institution, supporting young people between the ages of 14 and 16 who have been uh, very disengaged in uh, mainstream education, but who've found their niche at Newlands Junior College. And I listened carefully to what Jim McCall has said, whether it's in his uh, articles for the Herald or uh, having met with him on a couple of occasions. I, I do think that that Newlands example is part of that diversity and the calls for other examples of similar institutions across Scotland, I do not believe should be left unheard because that diversity is important. It motivates young people. It's plain for all to see when you visit Newlands uh, Junior College. I think uh, they deserve a great deal of credit for what they have done in that uh, diversity. So that, the strong messages from Ian Wood and from uh, institutions like Newlands, I, I think are very important. And may I also say that it was good to hear in uh, recent uh, time that um, the letter that uh, Shirley Ann Somerville sent to colleges that she was looking for a rebalancing of college places so that there was um, a, a much better emphasis on part-time places. I think that's a, an important thing um, and it matters for several uh, reasons but principally because these places increase the flexibility in the workforce but also because they allow the colleges to be much more responsive to the demands of their local economy and on a visit to Fife College, I was told just how important that ability actually is. Part-time places allow a much greater speed of turnover, and that is something that obviously is much more helpful. So I'm pleased that the Scottish Government, of course. Shall I answer, uh, Grateful um, for, for the opportunity just to, to, to restate our commitment to part-time places and to reiterate that indeed um, nearly three quarters of part-time uh, of all college places are on part-time courses. So the government continues to fund part-time and full-time courses, uh, particularly those that will encourage young people um, and those already in the job market into further employment. I take that point, Minister, but let's be honest, there was a lot of criticism about not sufficient emphasis on that. And I think to, to replace that emphasis is a good thing because it does allow that flexibility and it allows the ability, as I say, to, 
address the very specific demands of local economies. I think that's an encouraging sign. Um, Presiding officer, I think uh, my time is up, but I do want to say that I think this is a very important debate. Nothing is more important than the future of our young people. But I would like to see um, a, a greater a diver diversity of opportunity and no letting up of our attempts to engage uh, our young people in the choices that they themselves can make uh, to make Scotland into uh, a better place uh, to live, but also to have the better opportunities both in education and employment. So I'm very happy to support the Scottish Government's uh, motion and may I move the amendment in my own name. Thank you very much. I now call on Ian Gray to be followed by uh, Tavish Scott and if Mr Gray would move the amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I rise uh, indeed to move the amendment in my name and uh, to support the Government motion. The Wood Report uh, on which developing the Young Workforce Plan was based was, in my view, uh, one of the best reports of its kind that I can remember. It certainly uh, addressed a critical issue, not only for the future life chances of our young people, but also for the economic prospects of our country, ensuring that we have the skills we need for the jobs of the future and that we release the potential uh, of our future generations, this nation's greatest latent asset. It was a report which was uh, commendably clear and specific in what it required us to do, to provide more and more diverse paths for young learners to pursue, properly valuing vocational learning as well as academic, and breaking down the barriers between school, college, university, and the world of work in order to do so. And that is potentially a profound change. Uh, and the danger was uh, and is that we do it half-heartedly, as, as Liz Smith, I think, uh, has characterised. At the time of the report, I remember saying that if the result of the Wood report was just a few more pupils doing the odd college course while still at school, uh, then we would have failed. A consistent and concerted effort is needed to make Wood happen. So the fact that we have a seven-year plan and annual reports to track progress is, I think, very welcome. Uh, indeed. And there is uh, progress in the plan fairly noted uh, in the motion, not least, of course, the fall in youth unemployment, uh, to which I will return uh, later in my remarks. Uh, that progress in the report is reported in numbers, but it does reflect real opportunities for real young people. Only uh, a few weeks ago, I met Connor Waldron, last year's Foundation Apprentice of the Year. Connor did a manufacturing and engineering foundation apprenticeship as part of West Lothian College's Pathfinder programme uh, and then went on to a job as an apprentice mechanic with West Lothian Council, winning a job where 700 applied and 360 were interviewed for only two places. And Connor was in no doubt that he would not have had that chance had it not been for the foundation apprenticeship he completed. Indeed, he said, it's unreal what you get out of the foundation apprenticeship. He seriously felt that it had transformed his life. But there is a, a, a long way to go. At the same event, uh, Helen Young, deputy head of the West Lothian College Engineering Department, uh, who had uh, 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 overseen the programme from which Connor had benefited, talked of the, the many positive aspects of that programme but also uh, of the challenges they were facing, that they were having trouble recruiting to the programme because they were having trouble getting schools to promote it. Or when they did have students on the programme, schools undermined their motivation by insisting that they miss uh, their foundation apprenticeship training in order to help at sports days or take part in school concert rehearsals. Problems too with finding enough employers willing to provide work placements. The message I think that Helen was trying to put across was that developing young workforce programmes like foundation apprenticeships are not yet embedded in the system. Too many teachers and employers still don't know about them or if they do they don't take them seriously enough. They see them as something extra not on a par with say hires even although a foundation apprenticeship of course sits at level six uh, in uh, the qualification framework. And that's, that's there in the numbers too, I think. The, the, the Minister talked about 1,200 foundation apprenticeships, and that, that is progress from the 460 or so the year before. 
And I know that they are new, but it is still an average of around three per school. 3,000 level five vocational courses referred to in the report, that's still only an average of around eight per school. It may be that these opportunities are being made available now in every local authority. They are clearly not being made available uh, in every school. And we have a lot more to do to make them available, understood and valued in all schools as an option for all pupils. And that, of course, is before we get to... Sure. I mean, let, let me readily concede the point. I suppose it goes back to the point I've just made to, to Liz Smith, that we are at the, uh, virtually the onset of a journey. So I hope he will recognise we are progressing in the right uh, direction, but also in terms of the, the fundamental agenda of promoting the benefits of these opportunities. Would he join me in welcoming the fact that we now have 21 uh, regional groups, the right, the length and breadth of the country, which will help promote these opportunities across, the, uh, across all of Scotland? Well, well, I do. Of course I do. And I think I've just spent some time uh, illustrating the, the, the strength of the Foundation Apprenticeship and other parts of the vocational programme. My point is uh, to make those opportunities available more widely. And, and that's before we get to those young people where progress hasn't, in fact, been on track, of course, uh, as the motion fairly acknowledges, those who face particular barriers of disability, ethnicity, and ethnicity or care experience or traditional gender bias still very extreme in some frameworks and sectors such as construction or engineering where in fact the proportion of young women uh, in engineering actually fell from 6 to 5 percent in the last year. Uh, my point is just that we will not change this without intensifying our efforts one-to-one -one support for some young people, or, or efforts like those in Woodmill High School in, in Fife, where they have a three-year gender action plan involving CPD to change staff attitudes, engagement with parents to change their attitudes, and a complete redesign of course choice structure and language to encourage uh, young women to choose science subjects and other subjects traditionally where few women uh, did in, indeed study. So three years in, we, we, we are at the start, but we do need to be stepping up our efforts to transform young people's learning and skills choices, get beyond the pathfinders and the good examples towards a lasting transformation of the senior phase of school age education. But I think we also have to be more rigorous about how we measure success. Achieving that youth unemployment target is welcome. But we have to face up to how many young people are in temporary, insecure, part-time or zero-hour jobs. UK-wide, 36% of zero-hour contracts are filled by young people. If it's the same proportion here, that would mean 25,500 in Scotland. We count this as a positive destination, but it is not. This is not developing the young workforce. It is exploiting them. It is not opportunity it is alienation. We should stop counting this as positive and we should discourage it too by ensuring that publicly procured goods and services are not rewarding that kind of insecure and unfair employment. So we are entitled to celebrate success in developing the young workforce, but we are obliged now to redouble our efforts and deliver that success for all, for the many, as some might say, and not just a few. Thank you. I call Tavi Scott to speak to you in a move amendment 9821.1. Mr Scott, please. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. The merits of the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce programme are considerable, and Liz Smith, uh, Ian Gray and the Minister rightly set those out uh, this afternoon, both to tackle the scourge of youth unemployment and to revolutionise how we help young people prepare uh, for work and indeed for life. Uh, Sir Ian Wood's report was and remains fundamentally right. The world moves on uh, even from 2014, of course, and artificial intelligence and what that means for the workforce of tomorrow is one of the surely great unknowns in designing the policy approach for developing Scotland's young workforce and indeed the labour market more generally. But rereading the Wood Commission is the basis of my amendment today. Now, John Swinney may recall when he was the finance sector that I made the argument about decentralising skills development Scotland then, and I do again uh, today. 
I make the argument to the Minister Jamie Hepburn, not on the basis of, a, of any political points, but rather because I think there is a really serious case uh, for in supporting young people with a more flexible, adaptable and closer system of support, uh, and one that potentially saves some money as well, very appreciative of the challenges that any government faces, but one that therefore could allow more to be spent on a, the very apprenticeships and the flexible learning for, for, for vocational education uh, that we all seek to support. Uh, Decentralising Skills Development Scotland to the college regions would be consistent with the Wood Commission's thinking and indeed recommendations, uh, where they said, uh, for example, the newly formed regional colleges, and those of course were at that time in 2014, through more focused and ambitious outcome agreements, working closely with industry, should ensure that a college education provides skills and qualifications relevant to the market requirements, and in particular the new challenges of the modern technology oriented economy. Well, I agree with that. They also made a specific recommendation that the new regional colleges should have a primary focus on employment outcomes and supporting local economic development. Now, for me, the key word there is primary. Uh, uh, and the recommendation is clear and I believe that the arguments in favour of this decentralisation uh, are entirely consistent with uh, the thinking of the, and indeed the philosophy of the Wood Commission, as indeed they are with the Scottish... Uh, uh, happy to. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Scott for giving way. I, 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 I accept a, a lot of what he says and, and I think it's at the heart of how we've tried to implement the Wood Commission report with the, uh, the, the, the groups structured in a way that are aligned to the college regions and with particular account taken of the diverse geography which he particularly represents in the islands but also across the highlands and islands where we've taken particular course to make sure that the local dimension of setting that agenda is very much reflected in the way in which the DYW agenda is taken forward in all communities. Tabby Scott. I can uh, very much agree with the, the sentiments of the, of the Deputy First Minister's um, uh, suggestions there and, and uh, in how the programme uh, is working. What I'm arguing for today is for uh, a, a further development of how this service can be enhanced uh, for two reasons. Firstly, I've always believed that the strategic pur purpose of, st of, of, st of Skills Development Scotland could be subsumed into the enterprise agencies uh, and the Scottish Funding Council, who now, in fairness, come under the auspices of the board that Mr Brown set up uh, last year. So whatever I may think of that, there is at least a very clear structure in that case. But as importantly, or for some more importantly, it is what happens at a local and regional level, the point the Deputy First Minister has just made, uh, that needs to be enhanced. Improvements are necessary. Many see SDS as a top-down organisation that, given half a chance, imposes a one-size-fits-all regime uh, on everything that it goes with. Only after, for example, pressure from MSPs of all parties representing rural areas did they amend their previous proposals that would have made, would have made it very difficult for apprentices to undertake courses in specific colleges and locations in the central belt, which for many is still absolutely essential. I'm actually grateful to Mr Hepburn for the work he, he did on that. I know that at the Aberdeen uh, Developing Scotland's Young Workforce meeting just before Christmas, uh, colleges, the councils uh, and, and with the Scottish Government, uh, the plea was that creative policies would achieve better outcomes with the money that is available uh, if there was more flexibility. And all the evidence, or certainly some of the evidence I've been given, suggests that that does not come from SDS. Now, the Foundation Apprenticeship Mr, uh, Mr. Hepburn uh, talked about at some length today is a very good policy. It's the right policy, but it is bedeviled. And it's not me saying it is person after person who deals with this. It is bedeviled by bureaucracy, by form-filling systems processes and it's not just the SDS form filling systems and processes it's the fact they change them so regularly as well I, I can't be the only constituency member to have had that representation on a consistent basis over a matter of time so I'm arguing just for a simplification of that and if this was devolved to a college region level uh, where there was much more input from uh, the uh, from the business men and women who are on the regional boards that uh, Mr Hepburn has rightly set up and uh, who therefore had a very close hand in what and how those me methods were designed, I don't think we'd have the same concerns that are being expressed to me, certainly, about how this, this, this organisation currently operates. I just think we could do an awful lot better with the money that Mr Hepburn spent. Minister. Well, I, I take on board uh, the point he makes. If there are concerns about any level of bureaucracy, then it's incumbent on us to hear them and to respond. I would uh, suggest that doesn't necessarily suggest or lend itself to a radical overhaul of the structure of Skills Development Scotland, perhaps the, the man in which they implement some of the policies. So let me readily commit uh, now to, to happily meeting with Mr Scott to, to take on board any concerns he has. Well, 
Tabby Scott. Uh, I'm grateful for that. It's very fair. Um, I, I think I'll always uh, seek to argue for, uh, for a decentralisation model, but he's the government and he's got every right to, uh, to look at it. But I certainly, certainly um, recognise and, and applaud a commitment to uh, tackle um, systems that are not helpful in delivering the kind of services that we all uh, want to see. Uh, I want to make one obs other observation on SDS, if I may, presiding officer, and that is that their online careers service, the My World of Work, is not seen, as effect uh, seen by schools to be as effective as one-to-one uh, sessions for young people with local SDS staff. I believe the local SDS staff, I'm sure, right across the country are the stars in that particular organisation. But if they were given more flexibility and, rem and removed from some of the clutches of centralised control, they would be able to provide the more adaptable learning and responsiveness to local needs that would so enhance uh, the service. A service not, of course, just for young people, although that is the context of today's debate, where, but also for employers, for schools and colleges uh, too. Uh, Sir Ian Wood uh, made very clear his desire to see close working relationships evolving and sustaining between these crucial building blocks for, young persons, for a young person's future. I believe the responsibilities of SDS should be devolved to our college uh, regions right across the country. If the argument against that is that we need national programs and nothing else, well, I understand that, but we can have national programs, surely, that can be locally interpreted, flexibly designed with targets based on the real economic local needs, not imposed uh, from above. Different parts of Scotland, of course, will do different things. Glasgow College, with its size, with its economies of scales, and the city region to cater for, will take and should take different decisions to UHI colleges. I'm not arguing for reform for reform's sake, rather for an approach that can make this very important programme for Scotland's young people more adaptive to the ever-changing circumstances that our young people face. Putting the local and regional economic and vocational dimension at the heart of what we can offer young people so that they can make the choices that will shape their futures. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. And before I move on uh, to the open debate, can I just say, and I understand why members turn around when they're addressing somebody behind them, but if you do so, the microphone doesn't catch uh, what you're saying. That applies to all members. I know it's a courtesy to turn around, but it does mean that other members can't hear what you're saying. It's been drawn to my attention, so if you could just assist. I move on to the open debate. Gillian Martin, followed by Oliver Mundell. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm coming at this report from two standpoints, from that as of a former further education lecturer, the majority of my work in life has been focused on getting young people from all backgrounds into skilled, meaningful work. And secondly, I'm the only backbencher in this chamber in both the Education and Skills Committee and the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. So I've got an overview of the skills agenda from both those policy areas. And, and I, I welcome this report and of course the achievements that we've made, we've made in terms of youth employment um, and I, I welcome this report it see it, it's proof that equality is at the heart of the developing young workforce policy um, I, I did however have one reservation with the focus of the recommendations that were made uh, to the government from the national advisory group at the time um, and I've not really changed that view and, and that's that we have a largely unmet need in training and encouraging young people um, into enterprise and, and a changing work environment where more and more people are looking at self-employment um, and setting up companies as an option. And I, I'd like to see future development of the policy to focus on entrepreneurship and enterprise, as I think it could yield some very positive results, particularly in preparing young people for an ever-changing employment landscape and, crucially to this debate, promoting diversity in business leadership I take on board the Minister's comments about business management courses, but of course people study a, a great many uh, things um, and then find themselves setting up as self-employed as a result of that. And as it stands in our current demographic in entrepreneurship, it's not exactly one that screams equality. The majority of business owners in Scotland are white, male and from middle class backgrounds. And if we don't encourage more young women into setting up in business in particular, we're missing a huge opportunity. I've often mentioned the enterprise gap in this chamber and how if we had many, as many women setting up businesses as men in Scotland, we'd add uh, 7.6 billion pounds to our economy. And I also feel that schools, colleges and universities could do a little bit more in providing students with the basic skills and tools to set up in business. 
As many in this chamber will know, I lectured in television production and the creative industries is one sector where the vast majority will be self-employed, accessing work on a project or contract basis. It's simply the nature of the industry and it has been for a very long time. And I'll give you an example of where I'm coming from. Bizarrely, many years ago, a unit in the HND that I taught was dropped that taught many of the skills needed to operate as a self-employed individual. It was called freelance working skills, and to my mind, even though the subject matter could be perceived as dry, and the students did moan about it, believe me, especially after two exciting years of making films and producing live television, it was one of the most important units of the course because it taught students how to find work, how to get a portfolio or showreel ready, how to navigate the tax system, you see what I mean about being dry, how to set up a company, and most crucially, how to market themselves to clients as well as employers. And I always taught this unit around two months before graduation. Um, but when it was dropped from the curriculum, I found myself having to teach it ad hoc to make up for it. I've also discovered that there's no director in Scottish Enterprise that is directly responsible for engagement with the educational institutions. And whether that engagement be partnering businesses with educational establishments for innovation opportunities, but more relevant to this debate, engaging with graduating students to become the next generation of entrepreneurs and employers. And a, fo a focus on maximising the potential of those demographics not currently engaged in business creation could be a real winning formula. Um, as a former business owner myself, and currently the convener of Women in Enterprise Cross-Party Group, it won't surprise anyone that I very much think business creation is also a key route out of gender skills and employment segregation, restrictive traditional employment practices that do not meet the needs of those with family responsibilities or caring responsibilities, the gender pay gap and gender stereotyping. All things that led to me setting up my own company in 2001. These are issues that have blighted the workplace, of course, which most women in Scotland will be acutely aware. And they could be tackled at source with a focus on getting more women to set up in business themselves and becoming employers and business leaders. With a dearth of women in leadership positions in the private sector, it follows that not enough private sector companies have flexible working practices. Women on their boards, women in leadership roles, or women in the STEM roles. The drive for the quality of opportunity in the workplace so ensuring that there's parity in the take-up of modern apprenticeships, access to college and university is hugely important. But so too is creating the next generation of entrepreneurs and employers who must be diverse if we're going to tackle systemic inequality in the workplace. Give young people the tools to be confident in that area and we'll see generational change in the way the private sector operates, which will unlock our economic potential and ensure equality of opportunity. Thank you very much. Call Oliver Mundell to be followed by James Dornan. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I very much enjoyed uh, listening to Gillian Martin's uh, speech there. I do think a number of the points uh, she raises are, are very, very uh, valid uh, and, and something I experienced in my own constituency where there aren't always uh, natural uh, job opportunities for young people within existing companies and sometimes they've got to go out there and create those economic opportunities for themselves. I was also interested in some of the points made by Tavish Scott uh, around de decentralisation uh, of, of and, and flexibility uh, for, for different communities because again we see a great variation uh, across not just Scotland but across the constituency I represent uh, in uh, what's on offer and what the demands of the local economy are. I wanted to start with a little reflection uh, on a comment uh, that was made in uh, Marie Todd's speech uh, before the Christmas recess. Um, and it's, it's no reflection on her at all, uh, but I thought that it was interesting when she said that some other members of this parliament would be surprised to hear that young people chose enterprise and regeneration as key themes for the year ahead. Because in a way, I felt it spoke volumes uh, to some of the disconnect between policymakers uh, today and, and those of, of tomorrow. Uh, because in a region uh, with some of the greatest and perhaps most pressing economic challenges to be found the length and breadth of our nation, I wasn't surprised to hear that young people care about economic opportunities, that they're worried about the longer term sustainability of their own communities, and they really value 
uh, opportunities uh, that come along uh, around high-skilled jobs, uh, quality jobs, uh, jobs that are more than just a positive destination, that are about having a positive uh, outlook uh, for the rest of their life. And in that context, I do recognise uh, that de the developing young workforce has made an invaluable contribution. I, and my, I add a long overdue start in stemming the tide of centralisation uh, and decline. I'm greatly impressed uh, by what the local team have achieved in Dumfries and Galloway in a relatively short period of time, as well as bringing together and maximising existing local training and employment opportunities. Uh, the team have also done a sterling job in reaching out across what is a large and diverse rural area, instigating new ideas and initiatives, working with schools, the college sector, local businesses and young people themselves. They've done so much uh, to tackle the barriers that have emerged as a result of the urban rural divide across a great many years. There can be no denying, as the Minister I think has himself recognised in the opening speech, uh, that uh, there are often uh, real challenges in rural communities and that it's hard uh, to make uh, opportunities accessible to all, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to training. And I do welcome uh, very strongly uh, the progress that has been made. The issues I talk about that face uh, many of these rural communities have been around and have been uh, a long time in the making. And also, I think it's fair to say they're not unique uh, to Scotland. Uh, they do, however, have to be recognised. And in doing so, we must acknowledge that there aren't always easy fixes. And at the halfway point, uh, developing the young workforce is showing many encouraging signs, many welcome signs. Uh, but in my part uh, of the world, we're still uh, more than halfway from job done. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are also some broader concerns uh, that I have voiced previously in this chamber, uh, which I feel do stand in the way of progress, not just in rural communities across my Dumfrieshire constituency, but that are holding uh, young people back across Scotland. And I don't believe that it is until these issues are addressed that we will, that we will be able to move forward. I cannot help but feel we're asking the DYW team to do their jobs with one hand tied behind their backs. And while we're doing that, we're denying our young people the full opportunity to pursue their own aspirations and priorities. And as I've said already, it can't simply be about getting people into employment as an end in itself. It must be about ensuring that at every stage of their lives, our young people have what they need to succeed. And I'm afraid at the moment that they're being let down uh, by a government that sometimes uh, chooses to prioritise other things. And I think while well, today's uh, debate is welcome, sometimes uh, what we hear in this chamber doesn't match up with what young people feel uh, that the government's priorities are. Our education system no longer acts as a great leveller it once did. And I think every moment that we ignore that fact, we're selling our young people short and we're leaving many of them behind. That's why I welcome the constructive approach my colleague Liz Smith has set out when it comes to ensuring that every parent and pupil across Scotland gets a first-class educational experience at their local school. An approach that recognises the concerns of our teachers and their considerable efforts to make the best of the Scottish Government's poor implementation of the curriculum reform. I'm also worried that meanwhile in the college sector, we've seen over 150,000 college places disappear. And whilst I do welcome some of the moves to refocus efforts on uh, some of the part-time courses, we seem to have a government that all too often undervalues the economic contribution and tangible difference college courses make to ensuring we, ad to ensuring we address the skills gap in areas like Dumfries and Galloway. On higher education, we see continued complacency. I'm afraid you must draw your remarks to a conclusion. Uh, okay, on higher education, we've seen complacency, and I think that we need to uh, tackle uh, that and make sure everyone has a fair crack at the whip. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by Elaine Smith, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Oliver Mundell was doing so well there, right up until the last couple of paragraphs where he, he, he fell into the old trap of uh, slogans and cliches. 
The, can, I, can I just uh, comment on um, Liz Smith's mention of Newlands Junior College? I was going to mention it in my speech later on. I've, I've visited it, it's in my constituency, and I've visited it a few times and spoke to Mr McCall and others, and uh, it is a, a, a very good example of how people from difficult circumstances finding school uh, and education difficult in the, in the whole can then move on and uh, make a difference to their lives. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, I'm delighted, presiding officer, to be part of today's debate and I feel it couldn't be better timed at the beginning of uh, Scotland's year of celebrating young people. However, as I well know, we're not young people forever. And therefore it's vital that we're committed to ensuring that all of our young people regardless of background, find themselves able to reach a positive destination. And to that end, I was delighted to read that the, we are four years ahead of schedule of our target for reducing youth unemployment by 40%. The government is right to congratulate the many parties within, the partners within local authorities, employers, and of course those within the education system. Many of you will have read in detail the response to this report from Action for Children Scotland and the many barriers which they feel prevent young people from obtaining a secured employed position. No knowledge of how to put a CV together or a lack of confidence with the interview process. I remember my first experience of interviews all too well. It can indeed be, a, believe it or not, it's not completely gone yet. It can indeed be a daunting and, in my case, embarrassing prospect. And as an adult, I still feel nervous at the thought of some of the early interviews. So I can only imagine what it's like for someone who's never been outside of an educational establishment. Action for Children did state that they've sought to work collaboratively with schools to engage young people in vocational opportunities. Many young people across Scotland leave school in an afternoon to attend work placements, allowing them to experience that change from educational to employed environment. These opportunities also provide young people with the necessary work experience requirements that prospective employers now look for in a CV. And I'll go into more detail about this later in my speech because I think these are terrific opportunities. As in so many cases, though, education is the key to so much. I'll now turn briefly to my role as convener of the Education and Skills Committee. The committee has a strong interest, clearly, in vocational learning across our schools, colleges, universities, and through apprenticeships. And while the committee is not undertaking a specific piece of work in vocational education, it's very much part of our day-to-day -day scrutiny of education policy. For example, in September, the committee had an evidence session with the SQA, and during that session, the committee explored how vocational qualifications have been taken within the senior phase, and in some cases, the SQA suggested that some vocational courses had displaced academic courses. This is an area the Scottish Government, as I know, is working on in its Learner Journey Review, and is also very much on the committee's radar and a topic the committee may explore in more detail in the future. One very important aspect of the Wood Report in the Developing Young Workforce Programme is the issues of equalities, in particular gender segregation and modern apprenticeships and other vocational learning, which I know has been brought up earlier. The Wood Report re recommends that Skills Development Scotland create an equalities action plan for modern apprenticeships and SDS publish an action plan in des December 2015 covering five years. In our report on the performance and role of key education and skills bodies last year, the committee noted that there may be wider societal prop issues that lead to gender imbalance in the uptake of certain modern apprenticeships. Nevertheless, the committee urges Skills Development Scotland to ensure that its programmes are accessible and attractive to all of Scotland's young people. The committee will continue its watching brief on the progress and implementation of the SDS Qualities Action Plan. Now, while making these very important points, I do think it's prudent that we highlight the success of these vocational training programmes to date. And I'd like to take some time to provide details of the many benefits to the Chamber. The Foundation Apprenticeships, which, as we already know, enables mostly S5 and S6 to be released from school at certain times, is to work with a local employer is doing this alongside the other academic qualifications and allows people to develop a brilliant vocational skill set alongside their academic achievements. However, it's more than that. It benefits the pupil by giving them the opportunity to see how work is done. It benefits the employer, but it gives them a, an opportunity to see if they want to keep this man, man on, man or woman on, if they, uh, they've got somebody that already knows their business, already knows how it works, and already knows some of the people that are working in it. It also gives employers the opportunity to build great ties with local schools and colleges for providing the employees of the future. These apprenticeships are designed alongside employers and business owners, and that can only have a positive effect in any particular business which chooses to participate. Signing officer, this was a detailed report which not only outlined the various challenges which we will face while developing the young workforce,
but more, whilst accepting there are still these challenges to face, it's a report that highlights the importance of various organisations working together from educational establishments to the government, from schools and colleges to third sector organisations. Absolutely all of them are committed to our young people and I'd like to take this opportunity to voice my congratulations. I fully support these organisations in achieving the goals set out in the report, except that there's much more to do, but any investment in young people is an investment in the future in Scotland. Finally, I'd like to congratulate and thank our many young people who are working so hard to become part of a growing and ambitious workforce. The real achievements belong to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Ivan McKee. Ms Smith, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I put on the record that I'm a member of Unite the Union? At the end of last year, we debated the, forthcom well, the then forthcoming Year of Young People 2018. And now at the start of this new year, we are again, quite rightly, debating a young people's issue. Tackling youth unemployment is vital for our country's future, and pros uh, future prosperity, but it's also a major contributor to eradicating poverty and inequality in society. So this long-term strategy is both welcome and necessary. But could I just say that to affect real change, I believe it must be more radical and Labour's amendment would help to do that. And so, of course, I am, will be supporting Labour's amendment. President Officer, work is important in tackling poverty, but we also know that many children living in poverty are in families where parents do work, but they remain poor due to low wages and precarious employment conditions. Poverty wages and insecure employment are particularly prevalent amongst our young workforce. And the Unite campaign, Better Than Zero, which is run for young people, by young people, to tackle insecure and low-paid work is having some success in the hospitality industry. And I think that their message can be shared across other employment sectors. The approach taken by Better Than Zero also challenges the presumption that young people can work any hours and be as flexible as the employer wishes. Young people have many other commitments in their lives, including pursuing further study, caring responsibilities, and indeed as young parents themselves. Our young people deserve respect in the workplace, good terms and conditions of employment, and a safe working environment and a decent wage. President Officer, two of the ambitions of the Developing Young Workforce Programme for Schools are embedding meaningful employer involvement and stronger partnerships between employers and education. And I want to look at these important aims and raise some questions with the, the front bench around those. Perhaps, uh, firstly, the Minister could tell us if the employers involved are committed to fair work, including no zero hours contracts and a living wage. And it would also be helpful to know if the aims of the fair work framework are applied within the developing uh, young workforce programme. One recommendation is that the uh, growth business and inward investment companies in receipt of public funding should be encouraged and supported to employ young people. So an update on that would be welcome and whether it includes a commitment to a living wage. And another recommendation, which was mentioned earlier by my colleague uh, Ian Gray, is that procurement and supply chain policies should be used to encourage more employers to support the development of Scotland's young workforce. And I would also again be interested to know if uh, that would include fair pay and conditions in that recommendation. There should also be encouragement to recognise the benefits that collective bargaining brings, picking up on one of the five principles of the Fair Work Agenda, giving employees effective voice in the workplace. Now, obviously, these are areas where the Scottish Government can have a big influence and make a practical difference to young people's future prospects in the world of work. But I think revisiting what is considered to be a positive destination must be a priority. There also needs to be scope for supporting trade unions and speaking to young people in our schools on a regular basis, building on initiatives such as the STUC Unions Into Schools programme, because any partnership with employers should also include a meaningful partnership with trade unions in protecting and promoting workers' rights. So, whilst the numbers of young people undertaking modern apprenticeships continues to increase, which of course is to be welcomed, it would be helpful for the Minister to provide some additional information with regard to the fact that more than a fifth of those who are starting don't finish. Now, I appreciate that the reasons for this will be complex, but it is unacceptable that modern apprenticeships don't actually deliver for those young people. 
This figure might conceal a higher dropout rate amongst young people needing additional support or from particular backgrounds. Or maybe there's no child care in place, which was something uh, Gillian Martin, I think, alluded to earlier in her speech. In fact, it's surprising to see there's absolutely no reference to, that I can see, to incorporating support for young parents in uh, the Developing Young Workforce programme. And of course, uh, the other issue is one of uh, the gender issues involved as well, which I did raise earlier with the Minister. Turning specifically to disabled young people, um, I welcome the objective to increase the employment rate for young disabled people to the population average by 2021. This report shows that the employment rate in Scotland for young disabled people increased from 35.2% in 2014 to 40.8% in 2015. But it is cause for concern that it then decreased again to 35.6% during the same period in 2016. So I would be interested to hear an explanation for this and what steps have been taken to improve the situation. The Coalition of Disability Organisations, represented by Disability Agenda Scotland, has recently produced a very helpful report, End the Gap, with a number of strong recommendations for the future. And I'm sure that the Minister will take that expertise on board. There are already some welcome initiatives included in the programme, including, for example, Scotland's Employer Recruitment Incentive. And the report confirms that 1,600 employers have been supported by this financial incentive, giving disabled young people and young people with care experience employment opportunities. However, with regard to the long-term impact, we need to know the numbers of young people who have been assisted through the scheme and how many remain in employment with these employers. Um, there are other issues I could have raised. I don't think I have time, but one of those was support for learning in schools. That's vital for young disabled people, but it is an area that is suffering due to ongoing reduced government funding for councils. And I'm also interested in um, the cost of placements. These can be unaffordable, particularly for children living in poverty to access. So I would like to know if there's any assistance with that. Presiding officer, in closing, we know that for future prosperity of our country, our young people must be employed in secure, fairly paid work. Therefore, this is an important piece of work. The government should be recognised for putting it in place. However, it is equally important for all of us to scrutinise its progress, hold the government to account for any failure, because our young people deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ive McKee to fall by Gordon Lindhurst, and I would say there is some time for interventions, and your time will be made up. Uh, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and it's a pleasure to take part in this debate on the third annual report on developing the Young Workforce Programme, and I take this opportunity to remind the Chamber of my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Economy Portfolio. The Scottish Government's focus on inclusive growth is a key element of our economic strategy, giving everyone in our society the opportunity to participate in the workforce, contributing to our economy and allowing them to realise their potential is critical to driving that inclusive growth. And at a time when the Scottish Fiscal Commission has indicated that they believe Scotland's economy is currently operating above capacity, meaning that growth is constrained by a lack of appropriate workforce, it is essential that maximum effort is made to ensure that those furthest from the labour market are given opportunities to join the workforce. The parts of our country that suffer most from a lack of opportunity are those where the maximum focus needs to be to ensure that youth un young people are supported into work and that young people recognise that society as a whole values their contribution and has as a priority their future career prospects. Unfortunately, my own Glasgow Province constituency with the highest unemployment rate in the country is one such area and as such stands to benefit disproportionately from a successful youth employment strategy. Developing the young workforce is Scotland's youth employment strategy with the overall objective of reducing youth unemployment levels by 40 per cent. Yes, sure. Joanne Lamont. Your view on the, on the Labour amendment. Do you consider um, work which involves zero-hour contract and precarious work to be, should be counted as a positive destination for young people in your constituency and others? I from McKee. I think that um, the positive destinations are calculated the way they're calculated at the moment, and that makes sense. And I think the Minister may comment on that later. But I think that I think it's, it's important that people are helped back into work. Um, so moving on, the success of the, uh, the Development Young Workforce Programme is clear. Scotland now is the third lowest unemployment rate in the whole of the EU. The target set three years ago to reduce youth unemployment by 40% has been met four years early. And at 9.7% youth unemployment in Scotland compares very favourably with the UK average of 13%. Yet there is more work to be done. 
as the government motion recognises. This is particularly so in tackling gender imbalances in specific sectors and improving opportunities for all young people, particularly those who are disabled from ethnic minority backgrounds or who are care experienced. Changing perceptions of gender stereotypes is something I'm glad to see focus on, and it's something I've spoken on this chamber previously in debates on women in enterprise. And I echo the comments made by my colleague Gillian Martin earlier in the debate regarding both tackling gender imbalances and providing training and entrepreneurship and enterprise to young people to prepare them for the ever-changing world of work. The emphasis on providing support for care experienced young people to find their way in the world of work is also very positive. And I want to take this opportunity at this stage, if I may, to commend the work of MCR Pathways in their Young Glasgow Talent Programme, which works to train volunteers to spend an hour a week mentoring a young person, often a care experienced young person, providing them with the confidence to progress in the world of work. The programme includes work taster sessions with participating employers to give young people exposure to the world of work. The MCR programme has had considerable success with positive destinations for care experienced young people who have been mentored, increasing to an excess of the average of the general population. I myself, myself have been mentoring a young man in my constituency as part of the programme and I would recommend this to other members. Turning to the substance of the Developing the Young Workforce report, not only has progress been commendable at an overarching level, but I'm also particularly pleased to see the use of key performance indicators tracking progress and setting specific objectives for key elements of the programme ensuring a year-by-year -year focus on the actions required across all aspects of the programme required to deliver the substantial reductions in youth unemployment which are targeted and to maintain that going forward. The programme focuses on creating new work-based learning options, enabling young people to, engage in a, uh, to learn in a range of settings in their senior phase at school, embedding employer engagement in education, offering career advice at an earlier point in school and introducing new standards for career education and work placement. And it must be recognised that the programme is a partnership effort, including the Scottish Government, local government, employers and many other partners. Other ongoing elements of the strategy include a review of the whole 15 to 24 learner journey to ensure the system supports young people and their economy with the right balance of skills and qualifications. The STEM strategy with its objective of growing STEM literacy across society and encouraging and supporting everyone to develop their STEM capabilities throughout their lives. Less words, more numbers always a good thing, further expansion of foundation apprenticeships and modern apprenticeships, completion of the developing young workforce employer network, increasing the take up by business of investors and young people accolade, and of course establishment of the new enterprise and skills strategic board tasked with ensuring the effective use of the considerable resources the Scottish Government deploys to develop the workforce and support business growth. In conclusion, presiding officer, there is nothing more critical to the future long-term success of the Scottish economy and of Scottish society than ensuring that our young people, and that means all of our young people, have the training and opportunities to participate in the workforce to the fullest of their potential. The focus of this government on ensuring that this is the case is to be commended. And while there is still much work to be done, progress to date has been impressive. I look forward to future reports on the progress of the strategy, delivering as much progress as we have seen to date. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gordon Lindhurst, we followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Lindhurst, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The future of our country and our economy will be the backdrop to the future of our children, and our children will be that future. Scottish businesses rely on a skilled workforce to cope with the demands of a competitive, globalised world. For them, quality input is essential in delivering quality output. Quality in, quality out. One of the most important responsibilities of the Scottish Government, in my view, is to enable a climate in which quality input can be delivered so that our people and economy can flourish. Now, we've heard about the Wood Commission, which was tasked in 2013 with identifying how to establish a modern, responsive and valued system for vocational training, uh, with the goal to emulate the successes of other European labour markets. Now, some of those will be more familiar to some of us than others. Take the German example. It is no coincidence that Germany has the lowest level of unemployment in the EU for economically active 15 to 24-year-olds. No doubt the approach in that country assists in achieving this success. With teaching of a vocational education at Hauptschule level combined with opportunities to take part in a dual training, so a special system of apprenticeship involving training in a company whilst learning at school at the same time. This is an approach which can equally be seen in other countries, 
such as Switzerland. The Commission concluded from these that the vocational offering by schools in this country could be enhanced. I've seen myself how that vocational work can be beneficial with the Scottish Traditional Building Forum. They are exemplary in seeking to train up a traditional construction workforce for the future and spreading career awareness amongst young people. Such skills remain essential and young people joining skilled trades critical if we are to maintain cities like Edinburgh where traditional buildings showcase its world heritage site. And it was fantastic to meet school, pupils from schools across Scotland benefiting from this at an event I hosted recently at Holyrood with the STBF. And just one example from this, not from my own region, but St. Modens High School in Stirling, which was piloting a course called Roofing in the Classroom. Pupils can benefit from a more diverse education system through initiatives such as these. And often nowadays, we're told that pupils don't have an idea of what some of these traditional vocations are. And actually seeing these things in action is what can help them to identify with and say, that's something I'm interested in, that's something I want to do. Uh, and I think that's equally true of both uh, girls and boys. And it is something that, in my view, the government should fully endorse in collaboration with industry. For both sides have important roles to play. Our education system first and foremost needs to provide pupils with an education which gives the best grounding and basic skills. And if employers want a skilled workforce, they too have an interest to be involved in and support training within the system. The final report from the Wood Commission says as much when it discusses other European countries in which industry and education work together with each other. Businesses themselves providing their own overarching support infrastructure to make the opportunities available while children are still in education. The report says that exemplary industry leaders and employers should inspire their peers to do the same. And the government, um, certainly. Joanne Lamont. Do you think that exemplary employers should um, encourage precarious work and zero hours contracts? Or would you support Labour's call for these not to be included as positive destination or assessment of youth unemployment, or youth employment, sorry? Gordon Lindhurst. Well, I think it's, it's a, a, a complex series of issues there that I don't have time to address in this. But certainly, I do think employers should be encouraged to provide quality employment to their employees. And indeed, if we're talking about getting young people into vocations rather than simply just going into um, academic uh, educational routes. We need to get young people into companies to give them an idea of the sorts of jobs that they could do. And for example, um, girls who might not otherwise be encouraged into STEM subjects simply by being told about it in the classroom, if they see these things in action, it's things that they can identify with and they themselves may well choose to get, go into that sort of career whereas otherwise they won't. So I think that that is an important uh, aspect of this. And there, it is, I think, fair to say that there's no simple answers to all of these things. And in conclusion, I would simply mention two of the things the Scottish Conservatives have suggested. One is that the apprenticeship levy should be ring-fenced for in-work training to ensure greater numbers of business-led apprenticeships can be provided and also that a flexible skills fund could support qualifications other than apprenticeships, offering greater opportunities to our young people um, to support skills training so that they can benefit. Thank you. Oh, I thought you collided with your microphone there. There would be room there for somebody with skills training and first aid. Um, Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Joanne Lamont, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and in relation to today's uh, topic, let me draw members' attention to my being a professional member of the Association of Computing Machinery, a member at the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and a fellow of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of uh, Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, all of which uh, have an interest in education uh, of young people. Now, in relation to my own life experience, uh, I am largely an autodidact, which is a bit inconvenient because it means I have nobody to blame but myself uh, for any shortcomings in my knowledge and understanding uh, of, of, the, of the world. 
Um, now, I have, of course, uh, managed to re-engage with education in uh, recent times since stopping, to, stopping being a minister in 2012. Uh, I managed to find time to do a postgraduate certificate um, at uh, Strathclyde University and did it online. Now, the reason I raise that is because it's illustrative of the new ways in which education can be done, because it was an online course. Uh, which essentially I could choose what time of day I did uh, the study. I could choose uh, exactly when I was going to complete exercises. Um, if I came in bleary-eyed in the morning, uh, that might have been uh, some of the reasons uh, why that was possible. Now, that leads us to something much more broad, which we haven't mentioned, uh, that is enabled by the development of online computer training. And that is basically self-paced learning. Because I think particularly for people who have other responsibilities, they might be childcare, they might be caring for parents, being able to choose the pace at which you move through an educational system is going to be of value, particularly to people who find the present even quite flexible uh, approaches still uh, too restrictive. And as technology improves and develops, I think there's great scope for us to look in that area at further opportunities. Now, with that, I would encourage the government and others to think about where do people get access to the technology? Because often the people we want to bring into the system are those who have least access. So that means libraries, other public spaces, uh, perhaps computer terminals in public places, in, in voluntary sector as well. But equally, we need to have the people who are there at least able to provide the basics of support to people and provide a bit of uh, direction uh, if they find themselves in difficulties. Now, let me move on to the more generality, and that is uh, under the heading I would describe as achieving the impossible. One of the great things that our youngsters do is they do achieve the impossible, things that old lags like myself and others in the chamber here uh, might consider just beyond contemplation. They don't know are impossible and they achieve it. Um, I, I just, and I think I may have used the example before when I was minister, uh, we had only 12 million to do a wee bit of electrification of the railway network. All officials said it's 27 million. Can't be done for a penny less. Eventually they got fed up and gave it to an engineering, a graduate apprentice who did it for 12 million because he didn't know the project was impossible. And he did it with a very simple basis of a bit of the overhead wires had no power in them as they went under a bridge. So the bridge didn't have to be jacked up, the railway didn't have to be taken down. And that got it in at 12 million instead of 27 million. So there is in our youngsters and the people in the system a huge potential that at our peril that we talk them out of tackling the impossible uh, and succeeding. Now, we've talked a little bit about maths, and the great trick is I think the most expert mathematicians uh, that I ever see are people who don't regard themselves as doing any maths at all. And Liz uh, Smith talked about arithmetic. I was that cohort who sat the very first ordinary grade arithmetic exam in 1962. I found it rather simple, I must say, but others, I'm sure, found value of it. And the people, who, the people who use maths without knowing it's maths are the guys who stand, and it's mostly guys, sorry, uh, who are standing around the bookies with a wee short pencil behind their ear, and they're doing five-horse accumulators with complex odds, and they can instantly tell you how much money they'll win if it all comes to good. I can't do that. I have a degree in mathematics. So people aren't persuaded uh, to disconnect from using these kind of skills and acquiring these kind of skills if we don't persuade them to do so. I, 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 yes, I, I will. Elaine Smith. I thank the member for taking an intervention, but the huge potential that Stuart Stevenson mentioned of our young people, surely that won't be realised with um, insecure work and low pay. Stuart Stevenson, let me call you first. Stuart Stevenson. The, the member is absolutely correct. For some people who choose things like zero hours contracts, in other words, they work when it suits them, it's fine. Exploitative zero hours contracts controlled by employers, we can all condemn. 
So I just leave, I just leave that little thought. Let me just close, presiding officer, because I'm heading towards uh, the conclusion I have to come to. I very much welcome the support there's been in particular uh, for uh, people in rural areas such as Aberdeenshire uh, and uh, Murray. I think there is a wee bit more we've got to think about doing, and that is for those who have to attend classes, uh, we've still got the issue of how to get to college sometimes is quite an issue. The bus services have been retuned in the northeast uh, that is uh, generally uh, quite helpful. But finally, presiding officer, um, I want to just say three things. People need to learn for the life skills and learning a systematic approach, and that means learning actively about time management. They need to learn how to develop analytical skills they can apply. And finally, my own hobby horse, because I lectured to postgraduates for a couple of years in the subject, they need to learn project management skills. That applies to almost every area of life, almost every area uh, of work. And it's something that I don't hear specifically referred to. Presiding officer, I'm obliged. Thank you very much. I call Joanne Lambent to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Joanne Lambent, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm happy to contribute to this important debate. In this of all issues, the future opportunities for our young people and how we create a stronger and fairer, more resilient economy, it is critical that government policy is informed and shaped by real life experience. So we can't see this debate in isolation. It's important to understand that choices elsewhere in the system will have an impact on initiatives such as this. And it's essential, I think, that it's a proper assessment of individual budget choices, and local government cuts and education on the aims of this particular programme. It's certainly true in my view that the effectiveness of the Woods vision will in part rely on how schools can support them to take up the range of opportunities beyond the usual route of higher and university. But if schools are seeing, because of cuts to local government spending, the stripping out of the very support staff who would work with the most directly um, vulnerable young people and would work to support, these are no longer there, then the chances of the initiatives by the Wood, uh, identified by Wood will have less of an impact. But I want in my contribution to say a little more about the reality of working life for all too many people, in particular young people, but not exclusively, and perhaps challenge the Scottish Government a little about what within their powers they could do to address this. I want to talk about precarious work within which zero hours contracts feature heavily, with which, um, which in my work, which in my view, is the antithesis of the ambition of the Wood Report and the, the speeches of the government over some time in this matter. You don't have to go far to get the evidence. Direct experience of a couple of young people I know working for big companies in hospitality has given me more horror stories than I could ever have imagined. But it's important that this experience that they have described it, to understand this is not unusual, but we should reflect upon it. It isn't about choice. There's no certainty about when these young people are working. They may be given a week's notice, but they're still expected to be available. Minimal training, especially, for example, about personal safety in dealing with room service. Going in for a six-hour shift with a 40-minute journey to get there, only to be sent home after 30 minutes. Contracts that confirm that breakages will come out of the wages of individual workers. And if more is, uh, is breakages, the cost of breakages is more than earned in a particular week, there will be a facility for young people to pay up in instalments. Tips paid for in credit cards never reaching the staff themselves. Tips being used to make up when, start, um, when uh, customers walk out without paying. Young people working for six hours get paid for six hours. But you work for just over six hours, you'll be paid for five and a half hours because you're entitled to a break, which you didn't get, and you're not going to get paid for. Five minutes taken off the beginning of your shift and at the end of your shift to mark the time it takes you to walk from where you have logged in, where you have checked in, to where you go out. Gillian Martin. Um, I, I agree with your... Um, dismay about these working practices. Would you join with us in asking for employment law to be devolved to this place? Joanne Lamont. I'm going to go on and make a point about that in a moment. And as one young friend told me when I asked him how he knew he had lost his job, I found out, he said, when I looked at the roster and my name was not on it. 
As Better Than Zero campaign and others will tell you, this is not unusual, not just casual staff, not just young people, it's the routine experience of all too many people. This cannot be described as positive destinations for our young people or an aspiration of anyone in this chamber. In the Economy Committee in the last Parliament, we conducted an inquiry into fair work and I asked witnesses from the DWP a simple question. And that was whether a claimant would be sanctioned for refusing a job with a zero hours contract and all this insecurity that goes with it. They could not answer. Now, I understand the Scottish Government is not responsible for employment law, and we can have a debate about where those powers should properly lie. And I understand that they don't have responsibility for that aspect of welfare. But I do think it is reasonable to ask the Scottish Government the equivalent question. Should a zero-hours contract be regarded as a positive destination? And if so, why? And this matter um, becomes, as would and the Scottish Government acknowledge, this matter, sorry, because as Wood and Scottish Government acknowledge, this work is placed in the broader economic and social ambitions of the government. The Wood report matters because we care about youth employment. We should not sully that aspiration by having a category of work deemed to be a positive destination, which self-evidently isn't. So will the minister look again at the definition of a positive defi destination? The impact on young people of this routine exploitation will have a longer term impact on attitudes to work, ability to get on in work and to thrive in the economy. It is a cost to all of us, not just to the young people experiencing it. Finally, will the Scottish Government commit to using its power to encourage better and more far-sighted approaches by businesses, big and small? Is it reasonable to expect that recipients of the small business bonus should show that they do not have such exploitative practices? Will the Scottish Government ensure that Scottish enterprise or other support given to companies should be contingent on a commitment that they are not, these are, there are basic rights for employees, not to have the kinds of um, attitudes to those, that workforce as I have described? And will the Minister update us on the effectiveness of the business pledge in creating that good quality attitude by business? In conclusion, it must be a minimum commitment by the Minister that his own government's approach to zero-hours contracts, what they have said explicitly, their hostility to exploitative work, is followed through in all areas. And that's a bare minimum. Employment figures should reveal, not conceal, very significant levels of exploitation captured in positive destinations. I see the direction of travel of the Scottish Government in relation to the Wood Report and to young people. I care as deeply as anyone else about it. But we cannot, we cannot be in a place where it looks as if, on the one hand, we want to ensure that young people are given the best opportunities, and on the other hand, going along with practices which must surely be unacceptable. Thank you. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 2018, as the first ever Year of the Young People, provides an excellent opportunity to build on our existing achievements and to continue improving the life chances of Scotland's young people, whatever their background. I'd like to begin my contribution by welcoming the fact that the headline target of the strategy to reduce youth unemployment by 40% by 2021 has been met four years early. This is hugely positive progress and provides a solid base that we can continue to build on. In particular, although the broad target has been met, it's clear that there's still a bit of work to be done in addressing gender imbalances and in, and in improving opportunities and outcomes amongst particular groups, such as those who are, who are disabled, care experienced or from minority ethnic backgrounds. With continued strong partnership working between employers, schools, colleges and universities, supported by the regional DYW groups, I'm confident that we will see these improvements over the coming years. The Year of the Young People also serves as an important reminder that when we're talking about developing the workforce or meeting employers' needs, we're fundamentally speaking about the lives and experiences of individual young people. Yes, the impact on the economy and employers is an important dimension of today's debate, but equally, in fact, not equally, more importantly, is enriching young people's lives and aspirations by giving them a variety of different ways to succeed and to fulfil their potential. 
Apprenticeships have an important role to play here, giving people with skills not traditionally covered in school exams the opportunity to shine and excel, such as craft apprenticeships. The national picture on this is encouraging, showing a year-on-year -year increase in the number of modern apprenticeships at level three and above. This indicates that we're well on course to achieve the target. On a local level, I'm also pleased to say that DYW Ayrshire has been doing some great work over the past year, and I'd like to share a few examples with the Chamber. One of the most inspiring stories that I read about was of Martin and Son Builders, a small family business based in Cowinning in my constituency. The owner of the business, Martin, is profoundly deaf after losing his hearing five years ago. And one of the reasons he was keen to be involved with DYW Ayrshire was to demonstrate to pupils that this hasn't stopped him from running a successful business. Martin visited St Winning's Primary School for five consecutive days to give each of the five classes an insight into the building trade. Pupils participated in a series, series of interactive tasks which included using laser level, les, levels, sizing, measuring angles and calculating thermal heat loss. The young people were also introduced to bricklaying and watched a live demonstration of a small wall being erected. As well as introducing pupils to this career area and allowing them the opportunity to engage in interesting hands-on activities, Martin also sent them a powerful message to these pupils at a young age about overcoming challenges and achieving success. Turning to some of the high schools in my constituency, Auckland Harvey Academy has had great success with its Barista Cart Higher Grounds Coffee Bar, which functions as a coffee bar training facility for pupils such as Lucy. As well as undertaking an S4 customer service programme from which she gained hospitality specific qualifications, Lucy was able to gain valuable experience from working on the school's coffee bar. To quote Lucy herself, I enjoyed the course so much that I've now decided to focus on hospitality as a career and I'm now studying this at Ayrshire College. Another pupil who undertook the programme, Kai, said, the barista training has given me the confidence to work as part of a team and communicate effectively with customers of all types. I feel prepared to work in the hospitality industry now that I have my customer service, first aid at work, City and Guild's barista qualifications. Working in, at the Higher Grounds coffee bar has been one of my favourite experiences at Auchan Harvey Academy. Another good example is the partnership that's developed between the Hallmark Hotel in Irvine and DYW Ayrshire, with the hotel recently developing a hospitality training programme for S6 pupils at Greenwood Academy. At the end of the three training sessions, providing pupils meet the necessary criteria, Hallmark Hotels make job offers to the pupils to work on a casual basis, allowing them the, the work hours which they want, the work hours which fits in with their school and their extracurricular activities. Now that's a good example of how there is a place for mutually beneficial casual hours contracts, whether for workers such as young people who are still at school and um, fitting in a job around other commitments or for other employees who, who need casual work. That said, we do have to remain vigilant that mutually beneficial flexibility doesn't turn into exploitation. And we must always ensure that the employment being offered to our young people is of a good quality and that they're treated with respect, particularly where public funding and partnerships are involved. And fortunately, the hospitality sector is somewhere that um, examples of poor treatment and exploitation, more often than not of, of young workers, can be found. Unite the Unite Sphere Hospitality Charter provides a good benchmark when it comes to acceptable standards in the sector, and I'd like to take this opportunity to reiterate my support for the aims of its campaign. And in all sectors, including hospitality, we must be careful to ensure that a good balance between employer and employee interests. Young people who are ready and willing to work are a benefit to employers, but businesses themselves must also be, be prepared to invest in our young people to get them prepared for work and to develop them when they're in the role and not just to step in to employ them once they're trained elsewhere. Looking forward, one of the main targets now is to address the substantial gender imbalances that exist on certain courses and in certain industries. This applies equally to getting men into areas such as um, nursery teaching as it does to getting more women into science, technology, um, 
engineering and uh, maths areas. Colleagues won't be surprised that I'll take this opportunity again to highlight the exemplary work of Ayrshire College in this respect with their This Ayrshire Girl Can and This Ayrshire Man Cares campaigns, powerfully challenging gender stereotypes and transforming people's outlooks. I see the presiding officers nodding at me, so I'll close there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McGuire. You obviously had a lot more that you felt you wanted to say. Um, I call Michelle Ballantyne, followed by Graeme Day. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. On a recent visit to East Coast FM, a radio station based in Haddington, I saw firsthand how schools, employers and voluntary organisations can work together to develop young people's skills and prepare them for a job in their chosen field. East Coast has received national recognition, including a Princess, Tra Princess Tra Royal Training Award, and is a shining example of how to bridge the gap between school and work. Working with local secondary schools, East Coast FM trains young people how to produce their own radio shows in preparation for a career in that field. The station encourages young people to expand their skills and knowledge while giving them the chance to work towards something tangible, which for several alumni has led to jobs in the media. A similar success story is the textiles industry in the Scottish borders. Although this has sadly been in decline for several decades, in recent years, the sector has seen something of a resurgence. This is in part due to an influx of young people entering the industry. At the start of this decade, 12 local employers came together with other partners to create the Borders Textile Training Group, which develops fresh talent in textiles and weaving, helping this traditional industry enjoy a fresh lease of life in the 21st century. Other Borders initiatives, such as Harriet Watt University's industry programmes, have shown similar results and have provided a pool of young people with specialist knowledge who are valued the world over and are ready for work. Interestingly, these initiatives were created before the Wood Review, birthed from a desire to create a system that rewards hard work and reflects the marketplace, and they have all been resounding successes. Members, this is the kind of integrated strategy that is required if we're going to build new industries and preserve the ones we already have. The creation of employer-led regional groups is a step in the right direction, but as this report admits, these groups are still evolving. Engaging with existing employer groups to maximise cooperation and build, as the report puts it, sustainable industry-led infrastructure with an emphasis on developing skills in response to industry demand must be an essential step in bridging the gap between education and employment. At present, only 32% of employers recruit young people directly from education, and this figure has stagnated since 2014. Whilst many employers recognise the potential benefits of employing young people, the perception is often one of not having the time or resource to invest in training, and sadly in some cases a view that young people are not ready for the workplace, sometimes born out of a poor experience. We must provide our young people with education that is both academic and vocational and supports their choices about their futures and prepares them for the reality of work. I believe it was Thomas and A. Edison that said, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. However, presiding officer, it is important to remember Deputy Presiding Officer, trying to promote you there, uh, that this strategy, however, is not just about meeting targets. It is also about building a confident, enterprising workforce that values its place in our society. To ensure this, it is imperative that our education system provides not only a broad-based curriculum that has vocational training embedded, but there must be meaningful work experience available to all young people. Good quality work experience can play a key role in helping a young person make decisions about their future careers and can also give employers an opportunity to identify potential employees. The Scottish Government's recent review on the life chances of young people identified a number of issues that impact on a young person's well-being during their transition into work. An increasing number of our young people cannot get on the first rung of the housing ladder and are likely to be in lower quality employment than their elders, while many others struggle with the transition from school to work. This strain and uncertainty can take its toll, and as we have seen in the Life Chances Review, there is growing evidence of, of mental, growing mental health issues, particularly amongst young women, which the transition into employment can only serve to exacerbate. Presiding Officer, in this year of, year of Young People, which counts mental health as one of its main themes, I think there should be an acknowledgement of that fact in our young workforce strategy. However, I note this strategy does not contain a single reference to mental health, either in the initial document or in the subsequent annual reports. 
Although this was not included in Surrey and Wood's initial recommendations, this is an area that should be addressed to meet the man demands of today. And I urge ministers to examine this issue and its potential impact on our economy. To conclude, presiding officer, Scotland's young people are one of the country's greatest assets and it is in our national interest to ensure that they have access to the skills, training and support required for them to enter the world of work. The Scottish Government have taken some promising steps towards achieving this outcome, but they must be careful not to eschew quality for quantity in a race for statistical parity with other European nations. Although, as my colleagues have highlighted, we could learn much from some of these countries. Rather, as Sir Ian Wood noted, this is not just about numbers. It is about Scotland's long-term economic success and the well-being of its workforce. That should be our priority. Thank you. I call Graham Day to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I, I suspect it will come as no great surprise to members to learn that I intend focusing my remarks on young workforce developments in my neck of the woods. But in doing so, I, I want to highlight not just examples of success, but areas where improvements could, I think, be made. Let me begin on a positive note with two examples noted in the report. Following the development of Foundation Apprenticeship Skills Development Scotland has piloted work-based learning qualifications at SCQF levels four and five, including a project at level four, which involves pupils at Breakin High School in my colleague Mary Goujon's constituency, in partnership with Dundee and Angus College and a number of local employers. Knowing the work that goes on at the college, I was not at all surprised to read of it being at the forefront of developing our young workforce. And I very much look forward to welcoming the Minister for Employability <coughs> and Training to the college in a few weeks' time to see for himself some of the work going on there. The document also notes the Angus Works programme, which is driven by Angus Council. Uh, rather than the usual one week's work experience, that initiative sees school pupils have access to the work environment one day a week uh, across a 22-week programme. There are roles right across the council and Angus Alive, including in relation to trading standards, waste awareness, daycare support, clerical assistance museums, the list goes on. Pupils have to apply for the positions which carry with them proper job descriptions and provide a mentor skills and thereafter hopefully an endorsement from the employer, all incredibly useful. Now these benefits have to be earned the, the, uh, and the programme helps develop a sense of personal responsibility as participants have to sign a charter committing to catch up on the schoolwork they may have missed, all commendable. But let's turn to areas where barrier, uh, barriers to progress still exist. Presiding officer, it is as the motion indicates, as we've heard today, imperative to address gender issues within certain employment sectors. And I come at this mindful of an experience I had a little while back involving the first class Angus training group based in our broad, which produces the engineers of tomorrow and where the minister will also be visiting when he comes to my constituency. As we all know, attracting women into engineering is challenging to say the least. By way of perspective, since 2000, the training group has produced 629 apprentices. Uh, of these, just 26 have been female. Half of these women have come through in the last five years, so we are seeing a degree of improvement, but it's relatively minor. Traditionally, the young women to pass through the group's doors have had a family connection with engineering. The fact that's slowly changing is thanks in part to an excellent joint initiative in Aberdeen involving, if memory serves, the local education department and industry through which engineering is actively promoted in schools as a career choice for females. I met a couple of young women who'd taken up apprenticeships, apprenticeships via that route, two young women who'd experienced only encouragement to tread this path. Compare and contrast, uh, contrast that, however, with a third female apprentice on that year's intake a young woman from our broad itself who had joined them in spite of the best, perhaps that should be worst, efforts of her school. She told me that having had family links to engineering, this was the career she wanted to pursue, but sharing that ambition with some of those charged with guiding her education had provoked only negativity. She told me, and I quote, I was told engineering was not something that girls did, that I should be looking to childcare or beauty. Presiding officer, is it any wonder we find enticing young women into the sector so difficult when attitudes such as these remain? And that's not down to government or necessarily the delivery agencies. It is a societal problem. But I, I want to turn now to doing a Tavish Scott, as it were, and look at an aspect of developing the young workforce. I know it's a scary thought, where I think from my experience, Skills Development Scotland could in practice be doing better. And that is in actively and appropriately guiding young people towards careers where 
opportunity, increasing demand and decent salaries exist. I'm thinking specifically by way of example of fields such as occupational and speech therapy. One consequence of the population living longer is that we sadly will need more people filling such roles to assist recovery from things such as strokes. And my understanding is that there's a genuine shortage in these areas right now, which made a conversation I had with an SDS official, admittedly a little time ago, all the more perplexing. I asked why they seem not to point young people in the direction of such jo jobs, reasoning the these were highly skilled, well paid and had a long term future. To my surprise, I was told quite dismissively, it wasn't their role to point anyone towards a career choice. Now, on one level, I understand that entirely, but surely we ought to be highlighting such options <coughs> and encouraging consideration of them, thereby meeting workforce demand and handing our young people paths into sustainable long-term employment. Now, I was pleased to read the development in the Young for Workforce Progress Report, where it explores the efficiency and effectiveness of progression for 15 to 24 year olds through the education system. Uh, considering the tertiary education system from the perspective of what our society and our economy needs in terms of the balance of skills and qualifications is a welcome step. I note that the aim is to support young people to make and sustain positive choices and to ensure that our investment matches these ambitions as efficiently as possible. Good. The report goes on to state that there's an e expectation that the skills of young people will not only increase, but these will better match the needs of employers to further the Scottish economy. economy. This is the right direction of travel, of course. But STS staff on the ground need to be at very least highlighting occupations which they know require staffing and will likely do so in a few years uh, time and, and which they believe the people they are working with might be suited to. I'm happy to be corrected if my experience is unusual or a little bit out of date, but I contend the point I've made is an important one. We need the practical <coughs> delivery to match the intent established by government. Presiding officer, to conclude, um, there are excellent initiatives helping to support young people to prepare for the world of work. The progress made to date proves that. But there's no room for complacency. The world is ever changing and we need to do what we can to equip our young people to deal with that. Presiding officer. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Emma Harper. Deciding officer, um, developing Scotland's young workforce is important wherever you live, but in rural areas, the Scottish Government's seven-year programme can be transformative. Rural depopulation is a serious problem facing communities across Scotland, and of course, one of the biggest contributing factors is the lack of employment opportunities. And as soon as I say the word rural, I feel I should remind Chamber that I am the liaison officer to the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy. And encouraging economic diversity is key to creating employment and much of the work that I have done in Parliament has been focused on supporting and developing the rural economy. However, it is also vital that we make sure young people are aware of the possibilities and options which lie on their doorstep. This need was highlighted to me recently when I helped an unemployed young gentleman who had been made homeless. No one had ever suggested to him that farm work may be a good work option to consider and many farms actually have the ability to provide housing alongside employment. Unfortunately, Stranraer has one of the highest rates of youth unemployment in Scotland, but the developing the Young Workforce Programme in collaboration with Stranraer Academy is helping to make a real difference. Last year I had the privilege of opening the Stranraer DYW office and was welcomed by Justin Thomas and many education experts. Agriculture is a big employer in South Scotland, so the DYW have been working with Dumfries and Galloway Council and NFUS Vice President Gary Mitchell to encourage young persons to think about farming as a career path. Gary now has a young man from Stranraer Toon working full time on his dairy farm and Gary was even presented with the Champion in Developing the Young Workforce Award at the Dumfries and Galloway Business Awards in 2016. He's the only dairy farm that I've seen with a classroom. Another nominee last year was Jas P. Wilson Forest Machines. They have created pioneering relationships with educational establishments, especially Dalbiti High School and Springboard, which is a charity that works hard to train and equip young people for the hospitality, leisure and tourism industries. The Scottish Government's strategy recognises the need to create new vocational learning options and enable young people to learn in a range of settings in their senior phase of school. This is something else that has already happened at the new Dalbiti Learning Campus, which is a high school, primary school and nursery on one site. 
It has an automotive shop for pupils to learn how to work on cars, engines and tyres, and the cars were actually donated to WT High School by Jas P. Wilson. Last year, when Minister for Employability and Training uh, visited the company, Jas P. Wilson had 50 employees and one apprentice. One year later, they now have 60 employees and six apprentices, which is a great success story. Jas P. Wilson are committed to developing the young folk in and around Dalbiti, and they have a classroom on site too. The Royal Highland Education Trust, the NFUS policy manager, uh, George Jameson, they are also doing excellent work engaging with young kids from local high schools. And I attended the Royal Highland Education Trust Food and Farming Day recently at SRUC Crichton campus, and I was very impressed with the quality of the work RET is doing in the region. Over 300 students attended the event over two days this year, including home economic students from four and three secondary schools, as well as the entire S1 year group from Annan Academy, which is where I went to secondary school. I'm looking forward to bringing my wellies and volunteering at next year's event. Another area that I am particularly interested in is enabling more young people into careers in healthcare. And a career in healthcare doesn't just mean becoming a doctor or a nurse. There are so many other options, for example, physio and occupational therapy, optometry, health, su health support, and uh, Scottish Ambulance Service. The NHS provide a range of apprenticeships, including a new modern foundation apprenticeship for young people in S5 and S6. And while I was a clinical educator, I welcomed many young students to spend the day with me while they were doing their, uh, their um, modern uh, approach to learning. So for me, the foundation apprenticeships for the young S5 and F S6s, it helps them gain valuable work experience and access to practical learning. Modern apprenticeships are available to those aged 16 or over, and the apprenticeships are in healthcare support, and uh, also that's a qualification that allows people to build on a career working in a range of environments, including hospitals, health centres, and in the community. Presiding officer, as the minister's motion states, the headline target in the developing the young workforce strategy was to reduce youth employment, excluding those in full-time education, by 40% be between 2014 and 21. I agree with Ruth Maguire, and I too am delighted that the target was achieved in May 2017, four years earlier than anticipated. Presiding officer, this is a significant achievement, but it is important to continue the long-term programme plans and to strengthen education and skills partnerships and embed system change. Thank you. Now move to the closing speeches. A um, couple of members who took part in the debate uh, are not in the chamber, and that's disappointing. However, we first of all go to Tavish Scott. Six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, can I firstly suggest to uh, Graham Day that he does never copy my style of speech making? He's got a glittering career in Parliament in front of him, and he's and he's at the back, which I can hardly blame him for at, at, this, uh, at this stage. But uh, he, he uh, did actually, in fairness, raise uh, a significant issue uh, and indeed made a, uh, a positive idea for a former a, a principle of parliamentary uh, procedure, which uh, I commend to every uh, member. Debates are uh, here for, uh, for uh, the formation, formation of ideas and the suggestion and testing of, of thoughts. And uh, if Graham Day enters that uh, process uh, in this chamber every week, that be, will be better uh, for it. Um, the Minister started this debate by uh, reminding us, if, as if we needed reminding in some ways, that this is the year uh, of young people. But perhaps it is important to stress that and stress that and stress that again, because it is, all too, it is all too easy, I think, as, as Ian Gray rightly observed in his uh, opening remarks, to take your, the foot off your gas, uh, or take the foot off the gas, rather, uh, in the context of government programmes that get introduced uh, have, uh, have inevitably uh, some um, period where they're then reformed and are still, ne still needing that uh, impetus and that drive uh, after a number of years uh, to a number of years of implementation. So I, I uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I mentioned the project management, my contribution. One of the rules of project management, um, that the first 95% of a project takes half the time. 
I, so, I have a little time in hand, Mr. Scott. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, okay. I was so, so tempted to go into a whole thing about five percent there, but I, but I won't. But uh, uh, but I take uh, uh, I take Mr. Stevenson's um, uh, I take Mr. Stevenson's point. But I, I, I just simply want to suggest to the, to the government that they're uh, they're right to take I think uh, a positive uh, approach to uh, a seven-year program which takes a lot of government commitment and a lot of ministerial time, uh, because this program, the, the one that came out of Sir Ian Wood's commission, uh, I think deserves that kind of emphasis and deserves that constant ministerial attention in order to uh, make uh, the changes that are so very, very necessary. And the two changes I particularly want to highlight because I think they've come through many of the contributions that have been made uh, throughout the course of this debate this afternoon. The first is, is the... the in absolute uh, importance of constantly stressing the vocational routes into work and into uh, life. Uh, some of us have sat in this place for some time, uh, sat through some committees right back in the early days uh, where we produced reports into something called parity of esteem between vocational and academic, uh, academic routes again into work and into life. And we're still talking about it all these uh, years uh, later. And I, I, I share the concern that we, many of us have across the Parliament uh, that we've yet to absolutely nail that and that we've yet to make that definitive move to, to basically saying to every young person uh, in Scotland that, look, it doesn't matter which way you choose to go and where you want to end up, uh, the vocational route into life is every bit as important as the, as the academic one. And I can only uh, urge um, the Deputy First Minister and his ministerial colleagues to keep making that argument um, from their exalted heights of the ministerial uh, office. The second one is, the second one uh, that has come through a bit implicitly rather than possibly explicitly, and I say this because the Deputy First Minister is obviously going to wind up today's debate, and that is the role of the head teacher. Um, I think Ian Gray made mention of the fact that without uh, so without head teachers who absolutely believe in this, in this uh, programme, the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce programme, it doesn't fly in schools. And if it doesn't fly in schools, then it doesn't fly in any context. I mean, the, Jamie Hepburn, the Minister, was quite right to make the observation about breaking down the barriers that Ian Wood wanted uh, government to do between colleges and schools and businesses and the agencies that therefore support them. But it's about that head teacher in every uh, secondary school in Scotland wh wh that will make the difference. And I, can I just ask the Deputy First Minister, when he's reflecting if not today but in future on this debate that when he introduces his own governance proposals indeed they are introduced in fairness that uh, where he is asking head teachers to take on more responsibilities that some consideration is also given for the fact that across party and uh, across parliament we have absolutely put much commitment into this program it is fundamentally important to how we help and support our young people but if we constantly put pressures on pressure on our head teachers and this uh, that, that may come indeed with his proposals then then something will have to give and, and there has to be some consideration I think of the workload that we ask of our inspirational head teachers in, in every uh, part of uh, Scotland. Um, can I finally just in final two points uh, I fundamentally agree with Gillian Martin's point about uh, skills in school around setting up businesses and entrepreneurship. Um, I, I've heard her make that, um, made it make that case before and it doesn't, it bears repeating. It is a strong uh, case. Uh, I've been part as a constituency member of many a young enterprise company and, and supported and watched young enterprise companies with lots of initiatives. But there are not enough of them. They're, they're, they're not enough going on in Shetland. I, I'm sure there are many cases across uh, all the constituencies and areas that we represent where not enough is going uh, on. So I think, um, uh, dare I say it, that's another request there straight away of head teachers, but uh, there, there, there certainly does need, as Gillian Martin argued, to be more done uh, in that uh, particular area. And, this, and related to that, and uh, Graham Day made this argument, as did many others, about the need for um, a change or a constant drive to ensure that we encourage uh, young girls, girls and women uh, into uh, engineering into, and into other areas where as yet they are uh, either not properly represented or indeed I think as Graham Day said the statistics are actually going the wrong way in some uh, areas uh, too. Uh, at home in Shetland, the Shetland Learning Partnership did a huge amount to drive um, that to, to drive a program of introducing engineering courses at the F Fisheries College in Scalloway absolutely for uh, young girls and for women to say there is no impediment to, um, to uh, quite the co opposite. There, there is every encouragement um, for, uh, for all people to take part in those courses and I think that program needs to be pushed and pushed uh, and pushed again. Uh, and I therefore absolutely reflect um, as uh, Oliver Mandel and Ruth McGuire did, um, the support they showed for, their, for many of the initiatives in their own areas. I 
would just simply wish to thank um, John Henderson, the Managing Director of Ocean Kinetics, who chairs our local developing uh, workforce group in, in Shetland, and indeed Shona Thompson, who's the uh, very able um, support for all that through Shetland Islands uh, Council. Uh, one of John's employees, Shane Odie, actually is one of the apprentices of the year. He, uh, Jamie Hepburn may well have presented him with his award at the, at the Apprenticeship of the Year Awards um, uh, last year. He's an 18-year-old, very able young man um, who's an engineer now and is one of the, one of the young, young men in, 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 this, in that particular business who will ensure uh, that we continue to supply the right uh, uh, services for the oil and gas industry, for the fishing industry and for, for many others. So it is with those uh, observations that, above all, uh, can we stress and make the uh, make the case for the vocational routes into life, uh, that head teachers are not overwhelmed by uh, more initiative and instead are utterly supported in everything uh, that we ask uh, of them, and that we make a really, really strong case around engineering and other uh, traditional boy-only uh, car careers that are absolutely as applicable uh, to girls uh, and, and to do that in a, in a way which is positive and supportive, that I think the basis of this debate, we should consider it taken forward. Thank you. I now call Mary Fee. Six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to close this debate for Scottish Labour and voice my support not only for our amendment but also for the Government motion and other amendments. Ensuring our economy works for young people should be a priority for our government and for our education system. Unfortunately, in today's world, the odds are ever-increasing against young people with the high cost of living, rising student debt, and precarious work opportunities. That's why Scottish Labour lodged our amendment on removing employment on zero hours contracts from official government statistics on positive destinations for young people. And by amending the motion today, we look to all across the chamber to work with the government to change the methodology for school leavers so that zero hour contracts are not viewed as a positive destination. The government's developing the young workforce strategy must be about developing young people in and out of employment and zero hours contracts will not support the ambition of this strategy. So we call on members to back our position that the estimated 71,000 Scots on zero hour contracts deserve better, especially the estimated 25,000 young exploited Scots and correct the methodology for school leavers. Now, the debate today has been very much a consensual and a constructive debate, with recognition from across the chamber that whilst progress has been made, more needs to be done. And contributions from Elaine Smith, Joanne Lamont, James Dornan and Ivan McKee have touched on modern apprenticeships, zero hour contracts, STEM subjects, disability, gender segregation, and the issue of both young carers and young parents. And I want to additionally comment on some of those areas, particularly in relation to gender. James Dornan also mentioned the briefing from Action for Children. And I too want to touch on some of the comments they have made. And whilst they welcome the progress, they also focus some of their remarks on the practical and personal barriers that young people face. Their briefing highlights the lack of knowledge and understanding of CVs and the interview process and how young people can be helped to manage stress, anxiety and demoralisation. And Action for Children works with schools and are keen to expand on, on this work. And they also work with minority ethnic women to help them to overcome the barriers that they face. And I'll talk in a bit more detail about BME young people later. Elaine Smith also made the very important point about the costs young people face when on placement. And Gillian Martin also made the point about encouraging young people into enterprise and business. And I have to say, it's not an area I had ever really considered before, and it was a point that was very well made. Oliver Mundell and Emma Harper also highlighted the specific issues that young people in rural areas face and the measures that should be taken to help them. And, presiding officer, the overall figure on modern apprenticeships shows a very positive picture. However, when the stats are looked at in greater detail, there is still a volume of work to be done to ensure that female, disabled and BME people find and maintain an apprenticeship. Looking at apprenticeships and gender, it's clear that more can and should be done 
to end the segregation of roles in the workplace. Young people, male and female, should not be grouped in certain industries, and we need a far more inclusive approach to end that segregation. Skills Development Scotland aim to reduce the number of industries that are dominated by over 75% of one gender. However, the majority of apprenticeship sectors are male dominated, with only hairdressing and social services dominated by females. And the stats for the second quarter of this financial year show that only 1.5% of construction apprentices were held by female. The actual figure is 52 out of 3,285 modern apprenticeship starts. The same statistics released by SDS for quarter two of this financial year show there is a gulf in the opportunities for female, disabled and care experienced apprentices to start an apprentice, apprenticeship at level four and five and at level eight. Only 30% of females started this modern apprenticeship qualification. And when broken down, only 4.4% of all female modern apprentices are taking on this qualification, compared with 5.5% of male. For disabled modern apprentices, only 3.3% start at the highest level, compared with 6% for those not self-classifying as disabled. And for BME apprentices, the number is only 3.7%. And it is very easy to stand here and say that young people are our future. And indeed they are. And we as politicians have a responsibility to ensure that we do what we can to support them and help them as they move into the world of work. Undoubtedly, progress has been made. However, we need to work together collaboratively to ensure that that progress is not halted and that a positive destination does indeed become just that. Thank you. Call Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Eight minutes, please, Mr. Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the voices from across this chamber and the genuine interest that they've expressed in the development of Scotland's young workforce today. It's undoubtedly the duty of this Parliament not only to build the conditions for a successful economy, but to consider how progress can be sustainable for future generations. In 2013, the Developing the Young Workforce Agenda got off to a positive start with the appointment of the Independent Commission under the chairmanship of Sir Ian Wood. Others, as others have made very clear, the Commission's report in 2014 was a thorough and commendable body of work that was well received. His 11 key performance indicators addressed a number of significant issues of underperformance, some of which were long-standing. His findings drew attention to some of the genuine problems that faced young people on their journey into jobs and careers. Some of the statistics quoted in the Commission's report were stark, that less than 30% of Scottish businesses had any contact of any kind with education. Only 27% of employers offered work experience opportunities. Only 29% of employers recruited directly from education, and only 13% of employers had modern apprenticeships. While there were positives, it presented a backdrop of young people struggling to access their first opportunities and just as significantly struggling to be prepared for the workplace with, workplace with the skills that they needed. It offered challenges, challenges that were agreed by parties across this chamber. This week's progress report sets out a mixed bag of performances. In some areas there have been successes, in other areas uh, targets are in danger of being missed. I would like to welcome the, pro the progress on youth unemployment across Scotland and indeed on the positive labour market ch changes we have seen over recent years. This does however present a challenge of its own. To ensure that progress on employment is sustainable, that young people are equipped to progress in their chosen careers, and that young people are not the first to suffer when experiencing economic challenges. To provide for sustainable employment, it's clear that more needs to be done to develop skills. Too often we consider this, this issue, um, issue chiefly for young people. There is the real opportunity to create a culture where skills development continues throughout a person's life. My experience is that young people are aware that they're entering a more rapidly changing labour market. While prosperity has increased, some of the old assurances no longer exist. People are more likely to change career tracks several times in their lives, to be required to undertake new responsibilities and to require support and advice in how they move forward. The starting point of developing a skilled workforce, described by the Scottish Government as a fundamental building block for DYW, is careers education. In this area, the findings from the progress report were mixed. 
It found that provision made was not yet being implemented across all schools and early year settings, that what was available was inconsistent, that further progress is needed to ensure quality work placements, that primary schools are yet to embrace industry partnerships, and while expanding, sorry, while expanding meaningful partnerships with employers is set as an aspiration for next year. For, for DOIW to exist as more than a strategy, we must get the fundamentals right at an early stage. The choices open to young people are, are perhaps greater than ever before, which is why support and direction is needed more than ever. We must, we must also be clear that options are far from fallback choices. As Tavish Scott has mentioned, I think, in his contribution, having spoken with young people, there are still a number of stereotypes around entering into areas like modern apprenticeships or choosing not to go to university. These attitudes, which can often be reinforced rather than challenged by schools, represent opportunities missed. I'm also concerned at the report's finding that there is an uncertainty over the DYW lead coordinator post in some local authorities. Leadership at all levels will be essential a component in driving change. It's also unfortunate that, enough, that, that there is not more regional analysis of youth, un, uh, youth employment, education and skills. In my own region, the Highlands and Ireland, it becomes very apparent that there are quite distinct issues to other parts of Scotland that need to be addressed. In the Highlands and Islands, we see young people facing disproportionate problems from living in remote and rural areas. Accessing opportunities can be very difficult. Uh, very difficult. I've spoken about the, uh, the lower level of choice available in some councils in northern Scotland for young people entering foundation apprenticeships. The same is often true for those looking at accessing modern apprenticeship training and employment, although I was pleased with the comments from the minister earlier today. In these areas, schools must take on greater responsibility in terms of guidance and support. Yet we see from the report that much of the provision remains a patchwork rather than universal. Presiding officers, there have been a number of thoughtful and constructive contributions from across the chamber today. Um, we heard from Ian Gray and Gillian Martin, who used some specific examples and a very passionate contribution from Johan Lamont as well, as also some practical examples from Ruth Maguire. I also enjoyed Stuart Stevenson's contribution, using, demonstrating the practical um, use of uh, the skills and how that enhanced skills. Although I did note that uh, as he discussed time management, he moved into 30, minutes, 30 seconds over his own uh, times. <laughs> My colleague Liz Smith recognised that too many employers continue to see skills shortfall in some of the most fundamental areas as we continue to roll out cur curriculum for excellence. We have an opportunity to build on existing provision to ensure that young people are best prepared to enter the workforce. We also have the opportunity to provide young people with real choice across subjects, something uh, I have touched on upon in relation to foundation apprenticeships in some areas. She also highlighted the importance of STEM education. We've welcomed the Scottish Government's STEM strategy. The truth is that many of its steps were long overdue. Um, I've also covered some of the areas that Richard raised by uh, Oliver Mundell about the challenges faced by young people in remote and rural areas, areas accessing opportunities. And uh, Oliver Mundell also echoed uh, Tavish Scott's comments about decentralisation, which I would agree with too, and as well as the rural-urban divide. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne spoke about the importance of young people in, in her region being able to move from school to high-quality employment with training support. This was a key indicator in Sir Ian's Commission's report and an important option for young people who wish to travel down a vocational route. Provision of this sort of employment remains a patchwork across Scotland. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne also touched on the wider issue of mental health and, as well as well-being of young people, which is an area of increasing significance and one of the areas where young people's needs require a real cross-government effort. In the Scotland's Year of Young People, there ought to be a real focus on individuals being able to participate fully in their communities, not just through employment and education, and their well-being must be considered in the round. Earlier today, I spoke in Tom Arthur's excellent members' debate on care of positive employment initi initiatives. Schemes like this will be vital in ensuring that individual training and employment opportunity and the needs of young carers are catered for in years to come. Some colleagues have also looked further afield to models um, used internationally. Gordon Lind has discussed some of the experiences of technical and vocational education in Germany, while Liz Smith further expanded that scope to include Denmark and Switzerland. Gordon Lind has also highlighted some of the traditional skills that are becoming increasingly important in our tourism and heritage industries. One common thread was the issues employers have with basic skills in young people emerging from many years of education. In meetings with businesses, MSPs from all parties surely cannot have failed to notice this common complaint. There are a great many good ideas and no shortage of passion uh, in this debate. But if we are to make progress sustainable and measurable against all the objectives set out by Sir Ian Wood's commission, then the fundamentals must be in place at all levels of government. While we offer the Scottish Government support with its objectives, 
I hope that next year there will be some real actions in the areas we have outlined. And I call John Swinney. Can you take us up to decision time, please, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, Mr. Officer, this uh, has been a very informative and helpful debate in which I think members across the spectrum in, the, in Parliament have recognised there is a great deal to celebrate in the progress that's been made at the end of year three in the seven-year programme of commitment to the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Agenda. But as the Minister said at the outset of this debate, there is a recognition, and that recognition is absolutely central to the Government's approach in this respect, that we need to sustain the focus on the DYW agenda to make sure that over the course of the seven-year period we are able to realise the ambitions that were set out for us by the Wood Commission in the original report. Um, Ian Gray said in his contribution that the Wood Report was one of the best reports that has been written for government, and I wholeheartedly agree with that assessment of this report. It's a report that's characterised by clarity, which has assisted the implementation of the report. It has enabled the government to make the rapid progress that we have uh, been able to make. It has enabled us to engage businesses around the country to ensure the establishment of 21 regional groups based in the localities, based <coughs> fundamentally on our college network, but with greater distinction applied to the specific circumstances of the communities of the Highlands and Islands. And all of that activity has enabled us to engage the relevant parties to support our activities as a nation to ensure that we've made the headline achievement of achieving the stretching target and ambition uh, that we were supposed to reach by 2021 of reducing youth unemployment in Scotland by 40% compared to 2014 levels four years earlier than was envisaged in the original Wood Commission report. So the clarity and the strength of the Wood Report has assisted us in making that degree of progress which I think has been welcomed across the Chamber. It is important that the programme, and the Minister made this point, that we recognise the fact that we are part way through this programme and it needs to gather momentum. It principally needs to gather momentum in the involvement of the business community, working with individual schools at local levels. And as a number of members have made the point, and, and Tavis Scott made this in his contribution, his latter contribution, of the importance of ensuring that schools are absolutely immersed in this agenda. And the Minister and I saw at first hand one very good example of that when the, uh, the National DYW Group met at Our Ladies High School in Cumbernauld. Uh, we were able to see a vivid illustration of the way in which the programme has been incorporated fully into the work of that school. And indeed, yesterday I was in Wallace High School in Stirling and I saw again at first hand the prominence and the significance of the DYW agenda within the school. So I think increasingly around the country, schools have, have absorbed this because it enables schools to fulfill their central purpose, which is to ensure that young people are equipped with strong educational foundations for the remainder of their life and for the, uh, their working activity. And it enables schools to assist young people in reaching strong destinations. The, at the heart of the government's agenda in education is the drawing together of three principal policy planks, getting it right for every child, curriculum for excellence, and developing Scotland's young workforce. And the common theme between each of these three policy foundations is the importance of addressing the needs and the circumstances of each and every child, whether they are uh, our youngest citizens in getting it right for every child in their early years, or whether it's uh, school children through Curriculum for Excellence, or our older, young, uh, our older young people as they prepare for the workforce. Although I would say that there is now increasing uh, activity within the primary sector on involving the DYW agenda in the uh, delivery of the programme within um, uh, the, the primary sector to ensure that there's uh, we don't in any way delay the starting point at which young people become accustomed to the world of work and are aware of all of that. In the course of the debate, Gillian Martin made a really powerful contribution on the importance of ensuring that we tackle the issues around the skills gaps uh, based on gender and that particularly we supported the development of greater activity for women within self-employment and in enterprise 
And I think there is a lot to be encouraged about the progress that's been made in this respect, particularly through the work of Women's Enterprise Scotland, which is encouraging more and more women to think about business startup and to make that contribution. James Dornan made the point that vocational ed education um, qualifications are increasingly uh, or to a greater extent displacing academic qualifications, which is the objective of parity esteem that Tavish Scott talked about in his second contribution as well. And indeed, when I was handling the, on the two occasions that I've handled the SQA results uh, diet in August of 2016 and 2017, I tried to concentrate our communications on the fact that yes, we had over 150,000 higher passes in each diet, but we were seeing increasing numbers of vocational qualifications emerging through the fulfillment of curriculum for excellence within our education system. And indeed, in the most recent diet, over 50,000 qualifications, uh, vocational qualifications were achieved within our school system, which I think is the emergence of more significant evidence of the effect of the DYW agenda within our school system. Ivan McKee, in making a very powerful argument about the needs to make sure that we address the needs of all of our young people, cited particularly the experience of MCR Pathways, which has been piloted significantly within the city of Glasgow. And this mentoring approach, I think, is a very valuable and successful approach, which is engaging people who have time to contribute towards supporting the development and the, uh, of the aspirations of young people uh, in a very focused way. And I pay tribute to the leadership that Ian McRitchie has given to MCR Pathways. And I confirm to Parliament the government is actively involved in the engagement with MCR Pathways about how we can extend and strengthen that more broadly across uh, the country. Emma Harper made a, con a, comment, a number of comments about the importance of ensuring that we specifically address the issues of ru the rural communities and to ensure that we tailor the interventions that are made to, to do that. And of course, the prevalence of the DYW agenda within schools gives us a very effective way of ensuring that can take place in every part of our country. Um, Jamie Hulcrow Johnson, in his uh, summary for the Conservatives, um, lamented uh, some of the leadership that exists at local authority level. I want to say that the government appreciates enormously the contribution that's made by our local authorities to this agenda. And indeed, the, uh, my counterpart in COSLA Councillor Stephen McCabe jointly chairs the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce uh, National Group. And we value that leadership that is exercised by Councillor McCabe and indeed by all local authorities who are supporting this programme across the country. There were a couple of specific points that were raised in the debate that I want to address. Um, Mr Gray asked about the uh, degree of level three apprenticeships that uh, take their course. And we, uh, the, in 1617, 66% were at level three or above, which is slightly higher on the previous year. And um, obviously that represents a significant element of the quality of the apprenticeships that have been taken forward. Elaine Smith asked about uh, gender segregation, and in 1617, we know that 40% of overall modern apprenticeship statistic, uh, starts uh, were female. Now, that's not good enough, I accept that, but it is a stronger position uh, compared to previous years, but we do recognise we have more work to do, and within that headline figure, there will be more significant imbalances in particular areas of the uh, recruitment, and we want to make sure that we address that more wholeheartedly as we take further course in the programme. Um, Tavis Scott raised the issue about uh, localism within the design of many of these activities. And as I said in my intervention to him in his opening speech, we have been trying through all of this activity to ensure in our implementation of the Wood Commission report that the local developing Scotland's young workforce groups are designed to reflect that degree of localism. And indeed in the Highlands and Islands, we have particular groups for Shetland, for Orkney, for the Western Isles, but we also have three different groups within the, high, the Highland mainland area as well to try to recognise that diversity. And indeed, Skills Development Scotland have developed regional skills investment plans which recognise the diverse needs of localities within the country. And the first of those regional plans was in fact constructed and developed for the Highlands and Islands. And I think it's a very good uh, piece of work that assists us in that respect. Um, the Conservatives made a number of points about the, uh, the whole issue of uh, our educational foundations. And I would just simply point out to 
uh, to Oliver Mundell and to an extent to Liz Smith that there are really very strong foundations in our education system. The data that was published before Christmas showed that um, at uh, third level, S3, um, uh, th that uh, young people are reaching, 88% of young people are reaching the requisite level in numeracy, 90% in reading, 89% in writing, 91% in listening and talking. These are the strong foundations of curriculum for excellence. Of course, yes. Elizabeth. Uh, could you make comment on the reflection that employers make that too many of them are still saying that these basic skills are lacking when young people go into the workforce? I, 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 I listen to that survey evidence, but I, I'm presenting the data on the level of performance that's been achieved by young people within our education system. And I think that factual information is helpful in rebalancing the debate. Equally factually balancing of the debate is the point about part-time students. In 2015-16, 72% of entrance enrolments uh, on courses in our colleges were for part-time courses. 72%. So the idea that somehow nobody can get into a part-time course in our colleges is total nonsense. 72% in 2015-16. And the last observation I'd make on Oliver Mundell's contribution is that he talked about complacency in the higher education sector. Now, I don't understand the specifics of his point, but I remind Mr Mundell that the Conservatives are the first to criticise the government for any sense that we intervene in the governance and the arrangements of the higher education sector. And where we do intervene, we've just intervened to give the higher education sector a real terms increase in its funding. So there's precious little evidence of complacency in that respect. The last remarks I want to make are about the, the, the Labour Amendment and the points made by Joanne Lamont. The practices that Joanne Lamont set out in her examples of the experience of young people in certain zero hours contracts is a performance that I totally deprecate. It has no place in the fair work agenda that is taken forward by Keith Brown and which we apply across the board. But if we want to exercise the power to do something about the detail of those contracts, we must have control over employment law in this parliament. And the Labour Party, and Mr Gray was with me in the Smith Commission, the Labour Party would not, uh, I'll give away in a second, the Labour Party would not recommend the devolution of employment law to this Parliament to enable us to exercise those responsibilities. I'll give way to Mr Gray. Our amendment asks Mr Swinney to stop counting zero hours contracts as positive destinations. Johnson. You can do that. Well, for some, for, some, for some people in the labour market, and I, I, I caveat what I'm about to say with the fact that I've said to Joanne Lamont, the practice that she talked about, I deprecate. For some people, zero hours contracts will be what people want to have to enable them to pursue other aspects of their lives. So the, the Labour Amendment, the Labour Amendment, the Labour Amendment not only asks us to do something not only asks us to do something that the Labour Party will not give us the power to do, it is also something that runs against the practice that individuals want to take forward in our society. So when the Labour Party wants to support the devolution of employment law to our country, we can tackle the issues that John Lamont is concerned about. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 9857 on committee membership. Can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you. So our debate on, our debate on, on the young, force, young workforce is concluded. Thank you. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 9821.3 in the name of Liz Smith which seeks to amend motion 9821 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on developing the young workforce uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 9821.2 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie Hepburn be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now.
Thank you. The debate has concluded. The result of the vote on amendment number 9821.2 in the name of Ian Gray is yes, 26, no, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 9821.1 in the name of Tavish Scott, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Jamie Hepburn, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 9821 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended on developing the young workforce be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 9857 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. And I close this meeting. <laughs>